please purchase a personal license to remove this message. Chapter 6 Status of War in Other Religions When we seek to determine the desirability of a certain matter related to human life, the first to be determined is the nature of the matter, then the status that human understanding gives to that matter in comparison with other matters of similar nature. Only then is it awarded the position of desirability. As regards to human conflict, we have gone rather deeply in determining its nature and conceptual position in Islam. As a second step, we have to compare this Islamic concept with the conceptual position in other religions. For that purpose, we would have to go briefly into the field of comparative study of religions and then examine how in modern times, these methodologies compare with the methods of Islam, whether the aims and means in Islamic warfare are superior or inferior to others. If however, some religion holds war as totally impermissible, we have to examine whether the concept is in accordance with human nature. Comparisons of religions, is indeed a very difficult task. When a person holds a certain set of beliefs, it is not possible that he can do full justice to the beliefs and opinions of others. This is the general failing of human nature, but it acquires its worst form where religion is concerned. When adherents of one religion criticize another, they see only its darker side. The brighter aspects either totally escape their perception or, if it does not, they try to suppress its expression. Their critical analysis is not aimed at searching for the truth, rather to prove the correctness of their premeditated concepts and opinions. In such comparisons or criticism, other religions suffer. At the same time, no real advantage accrues to the religion of the critic, on account of the methods adopted to prove their point. If the only aim of comparison is to determine the truth and there is no other ulterior motive, even then it is not correct to be pre-opinionated at the outset. Study of other religions only with the intent of highlighting, what in one's opinion or looking for its weak points in order to prove the supremacy of one's own religion, is also not correct. This kind of dishonesty can neither yield any advantage to one's own religion nor can such methods be a source of pride for any true religion. If any person is led into belief through such methods, his belief cannot be worth much, since the very foundation of his religion is based on fraud and dishonesty. Keeping the foregoing in view, if comparison of religions is to bear any fruit, certain ground rules are to be adopted and followed religiously. In our opinion, the rules and principles that should be so adopted are annotated below one in order to prove the righteousness of one religion, it is not necessary that the teachings of other religions be proven totally wrong. If truth is the hallmark of one faith, its total absence from others is not a requisite. Righteousness is the quality of any true faith, which is not bounded by time and space. Manifestations of truth under all conditions definitely remain the part of one, single, whole entity. If the righteousness found in our religion is also observable in another, it is not a discredit to either religion. It rather proves that both religions spring from the same fountain of truth and righteousness. The fact is that wherever truth and righteousness are found, in whatever quantity, that particular faith has the right to them and should be given respect on account of them, rather than disfiguring the truth in order to discredit that religion. To any person who claims that righteousness and truth are the qualities of his religion alone, that discredits not only his religion, but also righteousness and truth as well. Perfect, truth, and righteousness, are present everywhere, in varying degrees. However, when scholars of comparative religion give preference to one religion over others, they mean that in their opinion, only one religion is the epitome of reality. It is therefore necessary that no scholar of comparative religion should decide beforehand, that apart from his favorite religion, all others are devoid of righteousness. He should rather understand that before him is a confusion of truths, half-truths, and utter falsehood. It should be his duty, to sort out the wheat from the chaff and as far as it is possible, using his understanding and discretion avoid each from confusing or overshadowing the other. 3. While indulging in religious research, it should be ensured that the works of the highly biased or prejudiced be avoided. One should be more particular about this in the initial stages of research, because, one would not be able to reach the correct conclusions having become biased in one direction, 
and all his following research will be affected by his biases. If one has to reach the right conclusion, one must study the original books, as far as possible, and based on this study, form his own opinion. When one has reached a conclusion, only then one may consult the works of others on the subject, since at that time one would be better armed to discern between truth and falsehood. In the following dissertation, the teachings regarding war have been examined. The three prerequisites of such comparisons have been adhered to and a non-partisan examination of the facts to determine the truth and falsehood of the proposition has been attempted. The four major religions of the world it is not possible to analyze the teachings of all the religions of the world, regarding war. Such comparative analysis is neither easy nor required. Ordinarily comparative study is limited to such religions that, owing to the large following, the immensity of the effects, their past and present glory, has come to be counted as the major religions of the world. Accordingly, the comparative analysis is herein limited to Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, and Christianity. For the purpose of comparative analysis, regarding concepts of war, these four major religions can be divided into two groups. One of these groups holds war permissible, it comprises of Hinduism and Judaism. The other group, comprising of Buddhism and Christianity, considers war impermissible. We will study these religions individually. Point 1 Hinduism The biggest problem faced while discussing Hinduism is in defining what indeed should be termed as Hinduism. The Hindu religion does not satisfy the sense that the word religion is generally used for. Religion requires a central belief, which forms its foundation. However, in Hinduism, one cannot discern any such basic and central belief. Different groups and ranks within the religion have sets of beliefs, principles, prayers, and religious books, quite different from the others, yet they all call themselves Hindus. Consequently, when we wish to get a ruling regarding some controversy, we find it difficult to determine as to which particular brand of the Hindu religion should be consulted. The difficulty has been to an extent overcome lately. Though the class system and sectarianism still exists, the current trend and inclination among Hindus has been to consolidate their theology and centralize it in three books. These are, the four Vedas, Gita, and Manu Samirdi. Whatever is stated about Hinduism, herein, is based on these three books 10. Because, the doctrine of non-violence was personified in Mahatma Gandhi from the times of the independence movement from the British rule in India, Hinduism in most of the period since Gandhi is depicted as a non-violent religion and its followers were in general regarded as such. However, lately the violent tendencies associated with Hindu revivalism have overwhelmingly surfaced in the otherwise regarded as the secular Republic of India. In this context, the following analysis of the teachings of Hinduism, although performed by Syed Mahdudi much earlier, has certainly become more relevant in this day and age. The three epochs of Hinduism the books mentioned in the foregoing section are actually from three different periods and as regards to warfare, depict three different aspects of Hindu thought. Vedas have their connection to that period of history when Aryans exuded from Central Asia and invaded India. Here they had to wage wars against a civilization that by virtue of color, creed, and race were completely different from them. The poetry in the Vedas describes the Aryan emotions during these confrontations, their attitude towards the locals, their aims and objectives in these wars and the treatment meted out to the locals. Gita is the book from the era in which all northern India had come under the sway of the Aryans and there was a contest between two influential and powerful Aryan families for the establishment of superiority over each other. This book provides us data concerning the Hindu philosophy of warfare, through the words of the eminent Hindu religious scholar and leader, Krishanji. The Manu Sami Tri is the collection of politico-religious and cultural laws from the era, when the entire Indian subcontinent was under the sovereignty of the Aryans and the non-Aryan entity had been almost totally annihilated. Many details regarding rules of warfare, treatment of the vanquished and their duties are available to us through this book. The Vedic teachings of warfare Vedas is the name given to four books which are individually known by different names. The most ancient of these is the Rig Veda. The others are Yajur Veda, the Samveda, and the Athar Veda. 
it is difficult to arrange the divisions of Vedas according to subjects, since in each chapter many varied subjects have been discussed. Therefore, in the interest of simplification only those parts have been segregated and copied in this book, that are concerned with warfare or acts related to warfare. Note the writer states that regarding Vedas, he has consulted translations of Griffith and Max Mahler. He regrets not knowing Sanskrit, he has had to place his dependence on European translators. He states that the study of erroneous translations of the Holy Quran makes him doubt the dependability of the translations of the Vedas too, on account of the European attitude. He requests the scholars who read this book, to notify him of any mistakes these translations may have led him into and any wrong conclusions he may have drawn on account of them. The translator also extends the same request for feedback from the scholars of the subject. Rig Veda The portions of the Rig Veda, in which the mention of war or conflict is found, are given below O Indur. Bring that wealth that would give happiness, the wealth that is the total victory of the victors that would help us destroy the enemy in combat 1812 O brilliant fire, you on whom holy oil is sprinkled, burn to ashes our enemies, who are protected by unholy spirits 1125 Indra and Verona. Grant us the victory that will bring us great wealth, which will make our treasure chests overflow with it, O Indra and Verona, I call you for wealth, in a number of ways, keep us victorious always 11767 Kill all that speak evil and destroy the one who seeks to harm us through sorcery. O Indra. Give us beautiful horses and cows, in thousands. O, oh, wealthy one. 129.7 Differentiate between Aryans and the non-believing Dasis non-Aryans. Punish them, and cast them in the haykept for the offerings of gods. 115.8 Please accept our offerings and may you feel content with the brilliant fire and drops of Samras, and our poverty of cows and horses. O oh, Indur. Scatter the Dasis known Orions and save us from their hatred, and allow us to gather food in plenty. O oh, Indur. Allow us to gather wealth and food in quantity. Grant us the strength of the braves, which is a necessity for gathering horses and cattle. 153.450 O Indur. Grant us increasing honor and grant us the terror and strength, which will overcome nations. And keep safe our wealthy chieftains and protect our kings and guard our wealth and food and pious children. 154.11 O Agni. God of fire, may your wealthy worshippers gain food and our chieftains, long life. May we gain war booties in fights with our enemies, and give the gods their share. O Agni! May we, with your help, conquer horses, and by horses, men, and by men other braves. 17459 Note Fair Colored, here, refers to the fair colored Aryans that came from Central Asia and invaded India. They were at war here with the locals of India who were dark colored and are referred here as Dasis or Dasis. Mighty Indiraja, along with his fair-colored friends conquered land and sunlight and water. O oh, Indur! Be our guardian and allow us to gather loot without fear 1118-19 O oh, Indur! You have for Poro and for your slave Devdas, and for your worshippers destroyed ninety castles. The powerful one has for Athithgo, brought down Somber from the mountains and with his might have great treasures distributed. Indur helped his worshippers in war. The one who won hundreds of victories in wars 113780 oh, Indur. May we with your help, find victory against those who oppose us, and may we vanquish those who oppose us. This day grant holiness to those, who pour some rus over your sacrificial fire. Give us strength, in return of our sacrifice, that we may fight and gain and distribute spoils of war 11328 with a good battle plan, when the brave people make the army advance, they gain victory, regularly. And to find fame, they keep advancing and crushing enemies 1-132-50 Indur. You are always the guardian of our men. O pious heart, O giver of victory over our enemies, grant us food that gives us strength, in plenty 1-174-10 O brave one. Looter of spoils. Lend speed to the carriage of men and like the ship burn to ashes the non-believing Dasis 1-175-3 O Mahun. O Indur. With your help may we overcome the enemy, who consider themselves strong, be our guardian, and make us advance, make us strong, 
and help us gain food in quantity 1 175 5 grant us wealth, and with your help and guidance, and the strength of the Aryans, may we overpower all our enemy Dasus 2 11 19 O brave one. Join our war crazed braves, and show such feats of valor, that you alone can accomplish. The enemy's pride is in their strength. Kill them and bring us their wealth to 310 O Indur. You have fought wars to gain cattle. Many are those who pray to you and sing your praises 533 4 Indur has control of the sun and horses and the cow that satisfies many a hungry one. He has captured treasures of gold and overwhelming the Dasis and kept the Aryans safe 334 39 O God of Fire. Any who seeks to attack us in stealth and any neighbor who seeks to harm us, burn him, with the strength of Mitra, burn him with the eternal flame. Help us fulfill our wish for great wealth, which we will take with our brave 65470 Indur. Grant us the qualities of bravery, the bravery that gains spoils of war. May we defeat our enemies in the battlefield, whether they be our own, or others. May we be victors in all battles. O oh brave one! May we vanquish both kinds of enemies and prosper with immense wealth. 61813 You have destroyed the seven castles of the Dasis, which were their summer retreat. You have put them under the sword and helped per Donna 62010 O oh Indur. Give us the wealth, that will help us vanquish the enemy, like the sky spreads over the earth, wealth, that brings prosperity, wealth that conquers the fertile agricultural lands, the wealth that defeats enemies 621 O Lord. We have arrived in such a country, which is devoid of pastures, which although is very vast, cannot sustain us. Help us in wars, to gain cattle. O Indur! Make a way for the singer of this hymn. Each day these black-faced creations are being made to flee the areas of the Aryans, by you. The brave one has killed this lowly class where the rivers meet 647 2021 O Indur. When the battle has warmed up, slay those who oppose us. Keep us safe from the prayers of the enemies against us and grant us fame and wealth. Make our enemies easy pray for us. O brave one! Give us victories and spoils of war and give us valuables to satisfy us. May we gain your supreme favor and may our braves have brave children 725-23-56. Ma'un. Make our enemies flee, and make easy, victories for us through whom we may gain wealth. Help us in wars for spoils and be our savior 732-25 O brave one. May we in your friendship combat enemies, who are angered to the extreme, and may we remain steadfast in battle against the enemy that has many cattle. 82111 Destroy the rotting tree, destroy the might of the Dasis. May we, with the help of Indur, distribute amongst us the treasures gathered by the Dasis. 846 O Agni. O God. To gain strength and power, people sing your hymns. Vex the enemy by putting fear in their hearts. O Agni. 1 T. You help us in gaining cattle and in winning wealth. 864 10 11 May we become so in war, that your guidance and help will be assured. We make these holy offerings that we gain spoils of war Dal Kila 570 Treasurer of Treasures. In our desire for treasures, we hold on to your right hand, since we know you, O brave one. Grant us excellent fair-faced cattle 1047 1, 3, for we are faced with Dasis, who have no religion, are devoid of intelligence, are outcasts of humanity and are followers of strange laws 10228 O Lord. Slayer of enemies, slayer of Dasis, bring us great wealth and treasures 1083 8 Slay our enemies, grant us their lands and property, show the miracles of your strength, and scatter those who hate us. O Manu! Overpower those who fight us, keep breaking and slaying them and treading over them 1084 23 Fight O True One! Strengthened with truth. Fight and grant us the wealth that has not yet been taken 10 112 10 O Indur. Fight with the Surya and overpower the Dasis 10 112 10 Make me the like an ox among my likes and make me the conqueror of enemies. Make me the slayer of my enemies, powerful ruler and owner of many cattle 10 165 1 Yajurveda in Yajurveda, we find the mention of war and acts connected with war, in the Mantur's prayers, 
mentioned below Agni. Grant us huge homes and pleasure, and destroy our enemies and make them flee, she fights to gain spoils in every war, beating the enemy, in its victorious March 844 Agni. Destroy those whom oppose us. Make our enemy flee. O Ajit. Slay the enemies, who do not believe in our gods, and grant us greatness and fame 1975 O great destroyer of Dasis. You have achieved brilliance from Pathia, you have gained spoils in every war 1143 burn him to ashes, the one who wishes to harm us, the one who sees us with hatred and the one who slanders us and troubles us 1180 O fire. The flames of which are growing as you precede us in battle and burn our enemies. O great fire! May the one who has done us evil, burn like dry wood. O Agni! Rise and make them flee who fight us. Show your heavenly strength 1312 13 wild beasts are its weapons, monsters have been its weapons. Our good wishes to these beasts, may they guard us and have pity on us. May we make the enemy their morsels, the enemy whom we hate and who hates us 1515 O Indur. You are famous for your strength, you are strong, powerful dangerous and a great fighter. You are the victor and you can overpower anyone. You are the son of success and victory, the looter of cows and wealth. You mount the carriage of victory leaving men trailing behind. Opener of stables, and looter of cows, you are the owner of weapons that destroy entire armies. Brothers follow him Inder and like yourselves, let the braves go free, and like Inder, show your courage and bravery that would leave your enemies senseless apu. Capture the enemies and take them away. Attack them and cast their hearts in fire. Burn them, so that our enemies are always in darkness 1737-38-44 Note Apu is the Hindu goddess of pestilence. Here Apu signifies the disease and pestilence that spreads in battlefields. Sambit Manter's prayers of Psalm Ved, in which there is a mention of war, are given below, Indur. Grant us the wealth that would enable us to rule over the talented and clever men. And give us the sovereign of wealth and power. May we call Inder and Pashan for friendship and prosperity and for looting spoils of war part 1, 31961 we the poets call you O Inder. So that we may achieve wealth and overlordship. O Inder. O chief of braves, people call you in wars, they call you in horse races, man will achieve spoils of war, only with his true partner, Parandi 31526 when we extract our juices, we sing our prayers to you, O oh brave one. We do so even when we loot the spoils. Grant us prosperity. With great cleverness, may we in your special protection, gain victories. O oh Indur. We hold your right hand. You are the real owner of wealth, we seek treasures by your blessing, because we consider you, the brave one, the owner of cattle, grant us splendid treasures. O oh hero of wars. O oh, splendorous and respected one! Grant us a part of the hordes of cattle for 145, and 6 sing with alms and offerings, the praises that make him happy, who with Robovan made the black hordes flee for 2411 note by black hordes is implied the dark-colored local non-Aryans, who at other places, have been referred to as Dasis or Dasis. O oh, brave one! In our fight with the owners of vast herds of cattle, be our friend and help us in our fight with the one who flares at us in anger 525 O oh terrible, O oh brilliant one. Without tiring make the darkness flee before you, and proceed like the bull. O oh Samrus! You make easy prey of the enemy and proceed as if boiling. O oh giver of intelligence and happiness. Make those who do not believe in gods, flee 61156 ahead of carriages the brave commander proceeds searching for spoils and his army rejoices 6151 when we loot the spoils, let the rivers of treasures, that hundreds of others desire, flow upon us 6215 may we gain victory and with it all the enemy's wealth and achieve man's greatest splendor and high respect part 2, 1183 we pray for spoils from the one who has food aplenty and who is the owner of cows in thousands 1113 O beloved of gods. Boil out with your satisfying juices and kill the sinners and the enemy along with their hatreds and thus gaining strength boil out more. 
You are indeed procurer of horses and cows to 115.12 Eternal are the favors of Indir. And never ending his sponsorship and protection, ever he grants his worshippers spoils consisting of cows a plenty to 13 Omegas, O Thundering One. Out of your graciousness take us to some corral that is full of cows to 2.11.2 O ever vigilant one, join the sons of Kanway and without hesitating, gain spoils of war in their thousands. O busy Maun. With great desire in our hearts, in our prayers, we wish for gold and cows in plenty to 2.12.3 O true Lord. May we gain food a plenty and a place to live, out of your graciousness. O Mitro. May we become your own. O Mitro. Protect us and with your protection save us. O desirable protector. May we overpower the Dasis 32823 O brave one. O looter of spoils. Let the carriage of man roll fast. O conqueror. Like a volatile ship, burn unreligious Dasis 6323 O beautiful one. When you hear our song, do not keep the wealth of your cows away from us. Wherever the slayer of Dasis goes, he opens the corral of cows, for whomever it belongs to 824230 Inder and Agni. With outstanding tactics, you have conquered 90 castles belonging to the Dasis 8, 12173 Atharvate in this book, the topic of warfare has come under discussion quite often. Some of the Mantor's prayer are copied here O Agni. Bring the evil spirits 11 bound, here, and with your thunder crush their heads 1770 oh, drinker of Samrus. Bring the Dasis along with their offsprings and slay them, or take out the eyes of these confessed sinners O oh, Mino. 12 come hither stronger than ever, and with your terror destroy our enemies. O oh, slayer of our enemies and Dasis, bring us all kinds of treasures 43213 O oh, king who grants true strength. Burn, who would give us sorrow and pain, who would behave with us like an enemy, who without having experienced pain at our hands or otherwise, seeks to trouble us. May I inflict on him the dual pain of fire 43212 May I with my strength overcome the Peshachu 13 and deprive them of their wealth. Whoever causes pain, may I slay him. Enable me to implement my decisions 4324 May Rora break your neck O Peshachu and grind your ribs to splinters and may we live here in splendor. O oh, Mitra Varoana. Beat the sinners and make them flee. May they find no shelter or solace and may they all die. 632 2 May our enemies be deprived of their hands, may we make their lazy hands useless. In this way O oh, Indir, may we distribute their wealth among ourselves. 666 3 Sew them up in rawhide, and make them cowardly like the deer, and then may we capture their cattle. 667 3 With the help of Indir, may we capture and distribute all the treasures our enemies have gathered. And like the law of Broana may I humble the arrogant and the mischievous 792 O God of fire. Enter their skins and burn them with your fire, crush their joints, so that the eaters of raw flesh may find them and kill them 834 O King of fire wherever you see the enemy, standing, or walking or flying, in your anger make holes in his skin, with your arrows 835 either pierce the hearts of the enemies with your arrows, or break the arms that are raised against you. Rise in flames in front of the devils, O Agni. Kill them with your leaping flames and may the spotted dead meat-eating donkeys eat them. Seek out this unholy and unclean enemy, like a man-eater does and break his upper body parts and with your flames, crush their ribs, O Agni. Make three parts of his lower body 8, 3, 6, 7, and 10 O Inder and Soma. Burn the unholy enemy and destroy him. O God. Come and humiliate those who heap sorrow upon sorrow on us, annihilate the fools, and make pieces of these devils in human form 3, 4 I Rig Veda, 1087 5, 10 Conqueror of Forts. Master of Wealth, Inder, has destroyed the enemy and like the peal of lightning, has overcome the Dasis. With his might, and his bravery, that none can withstand, and with his excellent ability, has overcome the dasis, of evil spirit and gained treasures of gold. He has completely destroyed the dasis and made the Aryan safe 2011 1, 6 and 9 an overview of the Vedic teachings of where we have copied the Vedic Mantra's prayers that deal with the subject of war, from the four Vedas, and in the interest of demonstrating the real spirit of the teachings, 
more than one mantar dealing with the same topic have been included. Following are the highlights of a careful study of these mantars 1. The Aryans were at war with a nation that differed from them in color, race, and creed who belonged to a different country. Aryans wanted to take over their lands and to make their own settlements on these occupied lands. 2. The Aryans regarded their enemies as devils in the shape of men and evil spirits. These locals were known and addressed by the Aryans by the degrading titles of Dasi, Desu, Rukshas, Yadu, Dan, Peshak etc. They were considered exempt of humanity, deprived of intelligence and understanding, and of a lower status of humans compared to the Aryans, they refused to give them a status equal to their own. 3. In their view, war did not hold any elevated ethical purpose. The Aryans were in pursuit of treasures, abundance of cattle, horses, other domestic animals, fertile lands, and comfortable homes. Maintaining ample stores of food was a fixation with them. Establishing their supremacy over other nations and being well regarded among their own people for their bravery and courage were their ideals. In the four Vedas, nowhere a more superior motive for war is perceivable. For in their wars with Aryan nations, there was no option for settlement through negotiations. The only end to such wars was perceived that one of the two parties to the conflict would either be completely annihilated, or overpowered. The main reason for the Aryan wars was that the other nation was not Aryan and did not hold their gods and religion sacred. It was not possible under these conditions that there could be any peace through negotiations, since a man cannot change his race and the Vedas do not prescribe spreading the religion through religious instructions. Nowhere is it mentioned in the Vedas that other nations were invited to their religion or that others had been included in their society, conditional to accepting certain laid-down norms. On the contrary, there is ample evidence that the Aryans considered the non-Aryans a lower category of human beings, of evil spirit and not worthy of being included in their worship or even of touching their religious books. This was the reason that wars with the locals continued, until these locals accepted life as untouchables or condescended to living in jungles and on mountains. 5. In the Vedas, it is not discernible, exactly, what treatment was meted out to the locals, but it is clear that they wanted to punish them terribly. Among the favored punishments desired for the enemies from their gods were skinning men alive, cutting off flesh from their live bodies, burning men, cutting off their limbs, having them torn up by beasts and even having the children of the enemies slaughtered. If these were their desires, one can imagine what their actions could have been. Gita's philosophy of War 14 The position that Gita occupies in the Hindu religion is mainly due to the fact that it is attributed to the great Hindu leader, Krishan. The clarity with which the Hindu religious philosophy has been put forward in Gita is not discernible in the entire rest of the Sanskrit literature. Although it deals to a great extent with Hindu Sufism, but the main stress of the book is on war. It has been written to incite a person of low morale into war and to excite a heart disgusted by bloodshed, to war again. A well-known incident of the period in which the Hindu culture was at its peak, is that the desire for wealth and authority caused a rift in the royal family of Santapur. The family was divided into sub-clans of Kaurus and Pandus, both in conflict with each other. All the rich and powerful noblemen were forced to take sides. Initially, a negotiated settlement was attempted, but when negotiations failed, war was resorted to. In this war, Krishan sided with the Pandus, since the chief of the Pandus was his disciple. In order to ensure success for the Pandus in the war, he assumed the reins of the command himself. When the opposing forces confronted each other in the battlefield, Arjun lamented, seeing his friends, relatives, and brothers, pining for each other's blood. He was deeply affected by the situation and decided to quit the confrontation. On this, Krishan gave him a long lecture covering the various aspects of the philosophy of war. This very same philosophical lecture is Bhagavad Gita. 15 Translator S. Note from this it is apparent that Krishanji's lecture has not reached us as delivered in the Pandu camp to Arjun, but as reported by an author from the opposing camp, which he states, was delivered by Krishan. This Kuru author's source or how he reached the Pandu camp is neither known nor understandable. 
The declamation commences when Arjun seeing his relatives and friends in conflict with each other, gets disenchanted with the war and declares his sorrow to Krishanji, stating Hail Krishan. Seeing my relatives here, desiring battle with each other, my limbs go numb, my mouth feels dry, and I cannot control the shivering of my body with sorrow. I feel powerless to even hold my bow. O Kesu! I feel all things going upside down. In laying my own relatives, I do not see myself achieving any good. O Krishan! I do not desire victory or sovereignty or even satisfaction. O Govind Raj! What is the worth of this life and sovereign, these pleasures of kingship and satisfaction, when these people, have given up the very same luxuries, and have gathered here to do battle with each other. Even if the kingship of three such nations was at stake and they desired my death, I cannot find in me the inclination to slay them. O Mother Sodan what indeed is the worth of achievements in this world? Killing one's own relatives can in any way be justifiable. How, O Mother Sodan, can we remain happy in the knowledge that we have killed our own? We can clearly perceive the disadvantages of being anchorless, without the family support, then why should we strive for the destruction of our families? Why indeed should we not feel the inclination for avoiding this sin? The destruction of families mean the destruction of values and faith and with the destruction of values, vagrancy sets in. It is said that those who lose family values are indeed a condemned lotsi. We stand here, to actually kill our own relatives for the sake of the luxuries of kingship. This indeed, is a great sin we have undertaken. It will be much better that I do not put up any resistance and lay down my arms and then some well-armed Koru should come and kill me Adil 1, Ashlok 2846 Hearing these pure and tender words of Arjun, Krishanji taken by surprise, states to him O Arjun. Whence have these vagrant thoughts entered your heart? No noble person has ever entertained such thoughts. These can only lead a man to depravity and infamy. O Path! Do not act in such an unmanly fashion, this attitude does not become your splendid stature. Ascend from this weakness of heart and stand. 223 Arjun replies rather than killing the Korus, it is better that I spend the rest of my life as a beggar. Even if I kill my elders from the Korus, for their wealth, I would have to use their blood-stained material wealth in this world. How can we bear to live this life, having slain these elders? These very same people are arrayed against us 256 from the words of Arjun, it is clear that the Korus and Pandus were the subgroups of the same family, who, for the purpose of gaining sovereignty, were bent on destroying each other. Arjun could not bear the thought of the ensuing avaricious fratricide. The kind-hearted, noble soldier, affected by the pricking of his conscience, became disenchanted by the prospect. However, Krishanji negated his thoughts and put forward a new philosophy, which in the words of Gita, is stated below the thoughts and doubts that should be far from you, at this time, you are speaking of them now. And all this talk about understanding. Men of understanding do not put much value on life. One should not feel sorrow at anyone's death. As a man achieves his childhood, youth, and old age in the same body, similarly a man achieves another body on death. The real occupier of the body is the eternal spirit, and it is beyond comprehension. The bodies given to the spirit alone are mortal. So, O Arjun! Fight on the one who thinks the spirit kills or is killed, do not possess true understanding. The spirit is neither ever born or dies and it is not that once it comes into being, will never attain this status. It is eternal and continual. Therefore with the death of the body, the spirit does not die. O mortal! How can one who understands, that the spirit is immortal non-aging and indestructible, ever kill a person? The way a man takes off his clothes and puts on new ones, so, the master of the body, the spirit, casts his old body off and assumes a new one. No weapon cuts the spirit, no water draws it, no air dries it up. Therefore, considering the spirit, of that nature, does not do you credit to 1825 if you consider that the spirit is born with the man and dies with him, even then, O Mahabehu, grieving for it is not right for you, 
because anyone that is born has to die one day, and the one who dies has to be born again. Therefore, grieving for this predestiny does not become you 2.30 later, Krishanji stated another philosophy, which is in his own words given below even if you are the greatest of sinners, this boat of understanding will enable your crossing the sea of sins. Like the lighted flame burns all its fuel to ashes, similarly O Arjun, this fire of understanding, will burn free your acts of the bounds of vice and virtue 436-37 O Danje. The understanding spirit cannot remain bounded by vice. He who has the support of his understanding, and who made distant all doubts through his understanding, is able to rise above the discrimination of right and wrong. Therefore, cut asunder the doubts that have risen in your heart with the sword of understanding and with the strength of belief set up for war 441-42 One who cleanses his heart and keeps his senses in control and the spirits of all animals becomes his spirit, he can do anything without getting the effect of the reward or punishment for his crimes. 5-7 Who does his deeds is absolved from any crimes. He is not affected by the sin like the water does not stay on the lily pad. 5-10 A brief review of the philosophy of Gita The crux of the teachings of Krishan Z in plain words is as under based on the belief in reincarnation, a man after his death is reborn. Therefore, killing him is not a sin or crime. He will become alive again after his death anyway and his immortal spirit will not have any effect by his murder. The body is for the spirit as the garment for the body. Therefore, cutting someone's link between his body and his spirit is like tearing apart a piece of cloth. Regarding such acts as murder and its results as death and afterwards considering it as a sin or a crime and mourning it, is complete ignorance. In the light of true knowledge and enlightenment, a person who apparently kills someone but in reality he did not. Rather he only removes the covering of the body from the spirit and this is something to neither be sad about nor mourn. It would have been a sad story if the spirit would have also faced the death. The thing that is an accident is bound to vanish. Therefore, a human who is bound to die, what is the problem in killing him? That which is bound to happen, whether it happens with our hand or through nature, tomorrow the nature is going to bring death to him anyway, then if we kill him today, what is the difference? The one who found the transcendental connection Jiyin, for him there is no restriction of good or bad. For him all the deeds are permissible. The distinction of good and bad is only for those people who do not have this Jiyin -e or connection. So just achieve this connection Jiyin, then even the worst of the worst deed is not a sin for you. The logical end result of such philosophies is that human life would become valueless. Whoever so desired would destroy his brother's body, considering it an old garment and when questioned, he could put forward this philosophy of immortality of the body and evanescence of the body, and thus claim exemption from punishment for the crime of murder. Then when a person lays claims to deep understanding Jiyin, for him murder does not remain murder, no crime remains a crime and no sin, a sin. He would remain innocent whatever the crime he commits. The teachings of Gita nearly coax a man to war, but nowhere in it, is discernible the cause and aim for the achievement of which war is so liberally espoused. Nowhere in its pages is the reason presented which could justify the breaking up of the relation between the spirit and the body shedding of human blood, stated, or amplified. The basic consideration that could elevate war above the level of meaningless fracas and bloodshed is the aim or cause of the war. Only if the cause to be achieved is pure and morally sound can it lend piety to the undertaking. Conversely, no matter how gallant and principled the conduct of war, it would yet remain prohibitive and from the ethical viewpoint, would remain barbaric and inhuman, if the cause is deprived of piety and purity. Gita has totally ignored this basic aspect of war and in this connection shows no inclination for the guidance of man. The style and delivery of some of its teachings however, do give an idea as to what probably is Gita's standpoint on the subject. At one point, Krishanji states, O oh Arjun, this war is the door for deliverance, which has opened up for you. Such chances come the way of very lucky Kshatri's Hindu caste of soldiers. Therefore, if you refrain from this war, you would damage your own faith and your fame and increase your sins instead. People will eternally sing songs of your infamy. 
This infamy and censure are worse than death for a man 23234 all will believe that you fled the battlefield out of fear. Those who respect you today will consider you unworthy of it, your ill-wishers, and enemies will speak such words censuring your might and bravery that should not be uttered. What can be more painful translator s note than that? On the other hand, if you die fighting, you will achieve heaven and if you are victorious, you will achieve overlordship of the world. Rise. Therefore and resolutely do battle 23537 all aside, if you consider your faith alone, losing heart at this time, does not do you credit at all, since, for Akasha try, nothing in the world is worth more honor than to fight for a just cause 23116 O Arjun, I am the scourge, that has come to slay men. I have come to destroy them. Even if you do desist from the fight, all these soldiers arraigned for war will be slain. Therefore live. And gain your battle fame. Overpower the enemy and enjoy the fruits of victory and supremacy over large territories. I have already slain the enemy 1132 The words are no different from those spoken to fighters before battle to raise their morale and fighting spirit. The stated causes are also not much elevated from those that have often resulted in unwanted bloodshed. The same greed, the same craving for fame and glory, the same thirst for power and throne, the same fear of the despair of defeat, the same fear of the ignominy and censure are all in evidence here, the very same that induce worldly men to turmoil and conflict. There is no elevated ethical teaching in this, nor any supremacy of cause introduced. Man has not been instructed or guided beyond the satisfaction of his animal desires and emotions. Manu's instructions on War 17 The holy books of Manu are the best on Hindu religious instruction and have been in vogue for about 1,400 years among Hindu states and nations as an instrument for the conduct of affairs of state. The personality of the author has been lost in ambiguity, and neither has the period of its first publication been established. 18. It is an established fact however, that it is from that period when the Aryan society had progressed much and there was a need to codify and regulate the conduct of the affairs of the state. For the purpose, other books have been written in that period, but among all these, the status of Manu is unique. Other works are either criticism of Manu or almost a verbatim agreement of the original book, the Hindu scholars have rejected them. The current trend is to put full dependence on Manu and not on other books. We have in fact, no better reference material than Manu. Manu's writings are of the period when the Aryan kingdoms were established and there was much progress in the cultural and social life. It became necessary that the conduct of the affairs of the state be codified and adhered to. For that reason, the book provides us ample material regarding conduct of wars and related affairs and the laws governing them. Causes of wars The first aspect that begs attention, when studying wars, is its causes. Manu has not gone into any details regarding this aspect. However, the causes that he considers legitimate can be gleaned from the extracts given below those Raja's rulers, who on the face of the earth, either for the purpose of killing others or for defaming them, wage wars against them and do not turn back, will go straight to heaven, when they die 789 the world respects him whose forces are always on the alert and ready for war. It is incumbent on such Rajas to establish, with the help of his forces, his overlordship over all creatures of the world 7103 after readying for victory, Rajas should ensure that his opponents either accept his sovereign or he should use other means. These include but are not limited to, bribing, and appeasement of the influential in the enemy camp, clandestinely breaking up alignments and alliances and warfare 7107 the most important obligation of a raja after performance of his religious duties is the establishment of his sovereign over areas that have so far not been subjected and to adequately secure them 9251 the raja who acts according to his faith has as his primary duty the conquering of other countries and Never avoiding War 10 119 from the above extracts, it is evident that Manu's flight of imagination was not of any greater elevation than Krishun's his imagination too could not take him beyond the worldly pursuits of extension of empire, conquests of other kingdoms or the belittling of other Rajas. It could not elevate him beyond these goals towards some grand ethical pursuits. 
Like any normal being, he too considered kingship and sovereignty the peak of achievements of the powerful and advises them to always use their might in such pursuits. Such limited concepts can never be the epitome of some elevated thinking or high and pure ideals. The desire and pursuit for empires can never in themselves be the aim of ethics. The high aim of ethics and virtue are the well-being and welfare of humanity. From this standpoint, human blood, a nation's freedom, and the state of peace in a country are definitely more valuable. Ethics stands for the peace and progress of humanity, it deems the horrors of war, permissible, only in the event that there is no other option left, to rid humanity of the material, moral and spiritual usurpation, by some greed-crazed usurper. However, apparently Manu or any other Hindu philosopher never achieved that height of understanding. Some, who did choose to rise higher, crossed all bounds and arrived at the outskirts of Ahinsa, which is no less harmful for humanity, than the unrestricted permissibility of bloodshed. In fact, the ends of both philosophies are the same, i.e. the total destruction of a nation at the hands of mischief and troublemakers. Ethical bounds of war The code of conduct of war according to Manu is quite enlightened. In fact, its bounds are not very unlike the bounds imposed by Islam. His instructions are copied below for the benefit of the reader No participant in a battle shall use hidden weapons, or those dipped in poison multi-edged arrows, or spearheads heated in fire, for the purpose of killing the enemy 7-9 nor can a horse or carriage mounted soldier kill a foot soldier. Nor can one kill the one who begs for his life, nor the one whose hair have gone frenzied and open, nor the one who declares that he is one s prisoner, nor the one who is asleep, nor the one who is armorless, nor the one who is naked, nor the one who is unarmed, nor the one who is not a participant in the battle, nor the one who is at the time, in combat with another 79192 remembering the virtues of a nobleman, he should not kill a man whose weapon has broken, or one who is in extreme sorrow, or one who is grievously wounded, or one who is in a terrorized state, or the one who turns his back 793 carriage, horse, elephant, umbrella, apparel except the jewels that may be sewn in them, grains, domestic animals, women, all kinds of precious and solid materials except gold and silver, are the property of the one who wins them in war 796 of the things looted in war, a part of them is to be offered to the Raja, and those things not personally looted, are to be distributed among the Raja's army 797 when he lays a siege on an enemy and is encamped, he should burn the country to ashes and destroy the opposing Raja's logistic support animal feed, food storage etc and his water resources 7195, all wells and trenches that are the need of the enemy should all be destroyed. He should aim to put the enemy in fear, night and day 7195 when the enemy has been conquered, one should offer prayers to their god, their idols 19, and to their pious brahmans. He should extend his appreciation to those of the enemy, who deserves it and declare general amnesty 7106 after carefully taking note of their conquered enemy's reactions and plans, one should appoint a person from their royal family as the ruler, who should be under 1's instruction 72220 and he should declare the laws as enacted by them enemy, still operable and valid and attempt to gain the gratitude of the new Raja as well as the chieftains with gifts of gold and Precious Stone 7203 It is not possible to adhere to some of these instructions in actual combat. For example, the instruction that a mounted soldier should not slay an enemy on foot, or that the one whose hair opened up and were in disarray or the one who was armorless, should not be slain, or the one involved in combat with another, should not be attacked. In such laws and instructions, the attempted reform has been overshadowed by exhibitionistic ethics, resulting in the necessities of war and the bounds of ethics not remaining in balance. Naturally, a soldier cannot, in the heat of battle, always keep such dictates of ethics foremost in his consideration, and if he does, cannot fight. Conversely, at places, Manu has sacrificed the ethical considerations totally to the necessities of combat. In the conduct of war, completely burning and destroying the total logistics of a nation thereby forcing them to death by hunger, cannot be in consonance with the dictates of ethical sensibilities. 
Overall, however, the instructions of Manu are very refined and moralistic. In them, the enlightened thinking is evident, that even in enmity, there are some rights that a man has on others. In this regards, Manu's thinking are very close in nature to the Islamic rules of war, though they are not so moderate and modern. Treatment of the fallen enemy It has been stated earlier that Manu's laws came into effect when the non Aryan might had been crushed and there was not a single such kingdom left that could challenge the Aryans in all India. Therefore, it is quite fruitless to search in his laws for those that are specific for conflicts with the non Aryan entity. In this era, all non Aryans, who in Vedic terms are known as Dasi, Desu, and Rakshas etc., had either left the habitations, and took refuge in the mountains or having accepted defeat, had become a part of the Aryan society. They were allotted the lowest of human castes and being given the name of Shudars. We can only find from Manu's laws of warfare, how in inter-Hindu Aryan warfare, a Hindu Aryan conqueror can treat another Hindu Aryan conquered enemy. They do not show us what treatment a non-Hindu vanquished should get. For this purpose, we would have to examine Manu's rules for the treatment of Shudars. Extracts from these are given below. 1. Manu considers the Shudars of a lower status. He, on account of their birth, not their actions, considers them creatures below the level of humanity. Brahma gave birth to Brahmans from his mouth, Kshatris from his hands, the Vesh from his calves, and Shudars from his feet. The same is stated in Rig Ved 19.9.12 and in Bhagavat Pran 2.5.37 The first part of a Brahman's name should be indicative of respect and holiness, the Kshatri's, of strength, the Veshs, of wealth, and the Shudars, of lowliness. 6.13 The second part of a Brahman's name should indicate well-being, the Kshatri's, security, the Veshs, wealth, and the Shudars, Slavery and servitude 232 Only three castes are worthy of respect, the Brahman, the Kshatri and the Vesh. The fourth has but one life for ten elephants, horses, Shudars, the detestable milch people, tigers, cheetahs, and pigs are those creatures who have been created from the darkness 1243 2. Manu considers Shudars, low, dirty, impure, and despicable. He advises the Dawei respectable Aryans to avoid all contact with them. By allowing a Shudar girl to sit on his bed, a Brahmin goes to hell 317 he may not even stand in the shade of the same tree as a person expelled from his family or a Chindal a person born of a Brahmin mother and Shudar father 479 he, who teaches religion and the conduct of religious rites, will go to the hell called Ism whereeth 481 he should not recite the Veda in the presence of a Shudar 499 21 he should not eat the food of the Shudars 412 22 the food of a Shudar terminates the aura of spirituality of a person 4218 if a Brahmin eats the food of a Shudar, by mistake, he should fast for three days and if he does so, on purpose, the punishment prescribed is the same, as for a person who consumes the menstrual fluids of a woman, or urine, or excretion. For 322 if while he is eating his food, a Shudar touches him, a Brahmin should leave his food. Apstam 15 The one, who touches a chindal, can only attain purity by bathing 585 The funerals of Shudars should be taken out in the southern direction, out of a town and a child s in the northwestern or eastern directions 592 if a dead brahmin does not have a person of his own caste present his coffin should not be allowed to be touched by a shudar since any part of it touched by a shudar will not go to heaven 5104 children born of a brahmin kshatri or a vesh mother from shudar father is of an outcast class and is known as chindals kushtars and ago respectively and these are the lowliest of creatures 1012 the dwellings of the Chindals and Swopas people should be outside the villages and townships. Their property should consist only of dogs and donkeys, they should wear the clothes of the dead, their eating utensils should be partly broken and their jewelry should be of iron. They should always live as nomads. He one, who is careful of fulfilling his worldly and religious duties, should keep no contact with them. All their relations should be among their likes and marriages should also be between the people of the same status they should be given food in pieces of broken pottery, 
but the giver should avoid contact with them. They should not roam about in the dwellings at nights. If they come to the dwellings during the daytime, the particular mark or sign, allotted to them by the Rajas should be prominently visible on their bodies. They should perform the task of carrying away unclaimed bodies. The Chindals should act as executioners of those who have been awarded the death sentence, they have the right to the clothes and jewelry of the person so executed. 105152 The Brahmin should never take alms from a Shudar. If one does, and offers no sacrifice, he will be born a Chindal in his next life. 1124 If a Brahmin drinks water that has partly been drunk by a Shudar, will have to drink water boiled on grass and nothing else from dawn to dusk. For three days 1144 if a Brahmin eats food partly eaten by a Shudar first, will have to consume Ashju only, for seven days 11153-3. Manu insists that Shudars should be the slaves of the Dawei respected Aryan class. He states that the Shudars have been created only for the purpose of slavery of the Dawei and that is their only purpose in life. He states the only duty, that the All-Powerful has ordained for the Shudar is that he should, without complaint, serve the three. Brahman, Kashatri, and the VESH 1191 to continue to serve the Brahman is the best service that a Shudar can perform. Apart from this, whatever service he will perform, will not avail him at all. 10.123 The Raja should order every Shudar into the service of the Dawei 848 whether the Shudar has been bought or not, the Brahman can insist on service from him, since slavery of the Brahman has been preordained for the Shudar class 8 413 even if a Shudar is set free by his master, he cannot be a free man, since slavery is the condition preordained for the Shudar 8 417 4. Manu does not recognize the Shudar's right to own property. He states a Brahman can without hesitation, take over the property of his Shudar slave. He Shudar is such an entity, whose property can be legally appropriated by his master 8417 even if a Shudar possess the ability to gather wealth, he should be prevented from doing so, since the wealthy Shudar is a cause of discomfort and pain for the Brahman 101295. In the law of inheritance, the Shudar class is discriminated against. In some instances the Shudar class is totally disqualified from inheriting anything and in some cases, their rights of inheritance are limited as compared to those of the Dawei. If a Brahmin has four wives, one from each of the four castes and if all of his wives give birth to sons, his property will be inherited by his sons in accordance with the caste of the mother of each. The Brahmin woman's son will receive as his inheritance, all the cultivators, the servants, bulls, the riding horses, carriages, jewelry, and the house. Of the remaining part of the property, even, the Brahmin will receive the greater share the Brahmin woman's child will receive a third part of the remaining inheritance, the Kshatra's son, two parts, the Vesh woman's child 1.5 parts and the Shudar woman's son, one part alternately, a man of law may divide the total property of the deceased Brahmin and divide it among the inheritors, in such a way that the Brahmin woman's son gets four parts, the Kshatri woman's, three parts, the VESH woman s two parts, and the Shudar woman s only one part. Even if the Dawei women have no sons, the inheritance of the Shudar woman s son will be limited to the same one ten of the total. A Shudar woman s son is not eligible to any inheritance from a Brahmin, Kshatri, or VESH father s property, except that which the father gives him in his lifetime. This part of the law of inheritance differs from the above. The difference did not escape Manu, who amplifies it, by saying in his other works, Kalaka and Madhutethi, only that child of a Dawei is eligible to inheritance who is pious and whose mother was his father's formal wife. The children of the Dawei father from women of the Dawei classes will inherit their father's property in accordance with their mother's castes 9149156-6. In the civil law, Manu has treated the Shudar class most harshly. He gives them hardly any rights to life and self-respect. Comparatively, he has granted such protection to the rights of the Dawei that the rights of the Shudars are literally, almost non-existent. If a Shudar is disrespectful to a Dawei, his tongue may be cut out a 270 if a Shudar insults a Dawei, 
by name, or by caste, an iron rod of ten fingers length, heated in fire may be shoved down his throat a 271 if he arrogantly instructs the Brahman on his duties, the Raja may order burning hot oil be poured down his mouth and ears a 272 if the person of the lowest caste should our ventures to sit alongside a person of the highest caste Brahman, the Raja should punish the Shudar. By having him branded on his back, or have him expelled from the country, or have his hips cut off Shurayan if out of arrogance, he Shudar spits on a Brahman, the Raja should have his lips cut off, if he urinates on the Brahman, he should have his phala severed, if he throws his excreta on the Brahman, his anus should be cut off Gasay to 282 if a Shudar snatches at Brahman's hair, feet, beard, or throat. The Raja should forthwith order his hands cut off a 283 if a Shudar rapes a Dawai'i woman, the Shudar will have those parts of the body, with which he committed the rape, cut off and all his property confiscated. If the woman is married, the Shudar will have to forego all that is his, even his life. If a Vesh man rapes a Brahmin, his punishment will be confiscation of his property and one year's imprisonment. If a Kshatri man commits this crime, his punishment will be a fine of 1,000 dupans. Denomination of currency, or he will have his beard and mustaches shaved off with the urine of a donkey. If a Brahmin man commits the same crime, if it is without the consent of the woman he will have to pay a fine of 1,000 dupans and if it is with the consent of the woman, the fine will be 500 dupans. 8374-378 A Raja should never have a Brahmin put to death. He may without depriving him of his caste or property, order his banishment from the country. There is no greater sin on the face of the earth than shedding the blood of a Brahmin. Therefore the Raja should not even think of this. 8380381 A Pastam Dharam Shastar, states that the severest punishment that can be given to a Brahmin, for the major crimes of theft, robbery, or murder, is that he may be blinded to 17 but if a Shudar commits the same crime, his penalty will be death. 2 2. 27 On their own, these orders are an explanation of loathsomeness with which the Hindu law treats the vanquished, these laws amply illustrate the low stature accorded to them. In comparison, if we examine the rights of the non-Muslim subjects in Islamic law, we will find a mammoth difference. Racial discrimination in modern times, some Hindu writers, under the pressures of modern thinking, have declared that the division of castes is not by virtue of birth or race but on professional grounds and by virtue of the nature of the job performed. Indeed, it is a pleasurable thought, but one not supported by the original books on Hindu law and constitution. From those, what is apparent is that the Hindu religion has the least concern with professions and qualities, while stratifying society. Initially, the local people were known by the degrading titles of Das and Dasyu and later came to be called Shudars, not on account of their professions or actions but only because they were non-Aryans. A glance at the criminal and economic laws and the laws dealing with inheritance will make this fact obvious. We can observe that the most pious and righteous of Shudars do not possess the rights that a Brahmin, who conducts himself most disgracefully, does. The Brahmin's son, born of a Shudar woman, regardless of his abilities and righteousness of character and actions does not have rights equal to his brother, born of his father's Brahmin wife. A Brahmin mother's child born of a Shudar father, on the other hand, will be termed a chindal just on account of his birth and would have to go through life in the disgraceful conditions reserved for the chindals, according to Manu. Why should this be so? Does being born a Shudar's son, naturally make a person guilty of moral turpitude and being born of a Brahmin just naturally righteous? This in fact is not discrimination on account of character, conduct, or profession. It is outright racial discrimination at its worst. The righteousness or immorality of a person and his status in life has been predetermined on account of his progeny, not his conduct. In this regards Manu himself has been quite lucid and states a person born of a righteous man and a disgraceful woman has a chance of becoming righteous by his conduct. However, a person born of a disgraceful father and a respectable woman will always remain disgraceful. 1067 
although he cannot attain the full status of respectability, equal to the person having born of parents of respectable lineage Manu, 9149156 and 11127 like the growth of a tree of high quality is dependent on the quality of the seed and the land it is planted on, only the man born of a respectable father and respectable mother, can attain the status of a full-fledged the way Brahma has himself judged that the Shudars, who act righteously, as the Dawei should, and the Dawei, who act in the lowly fashion of the Shudar are neither comparable, nor incomparable. That is, neither does the degree of respectability of their action changes their status, nor is the actions of both are such that they cannot be compared. Note incomparability of status here denotes that the status of the Shudar and the Dawei, in society, will remain the same as preordained. The righteous actions of a Shudar are no doubt more respectable than the unrighteous action of a Dawei, the degree of respectability of the actions are comparable, not the respectability of the person who undertakes them. After consideration of the above, none can deny that the stratification of humanity, in accordance with Hindu religion, is based on racism and not on anything else. Modern consenters do not even attempt to deny that the Shudars are the local inhabitants of India and that they did not belong to any low caste of the Aryans. Unfortunately, even after clear proof, this fact remains unacceptable. No doubt, the Shudar caste includes some of the Aryans who have been expelled from their caste and society for gross violation of religious edicts Vedic Index of Names and Subjects, Volume 2 page 265 and 393. However, also without doubt is the fact that the title Shudar is reserved in general for those of the local inhabitants, who chose not to seek refuge in the mountains and accepted the subservience of the conqueror, the Aryan nation. Historical and linguistic research, has in fact, established that Shudar was the name of the first Indian tribe who the Aryans overpowered, in the valley of Adak, in the northwest of India. After that, whichever tribe in India accepted their subservience, were included in the nomenclature. Those who put up resistance were known as Dasius or Milch. Wilson, Indian Castes, Volume 1, Page 3. One of the basic Brahmanic teachings is, Brahman is a caste born of gods, while Shudars are born of the evil spirits Muir, Sanskrit texts, Page 14 This saying removes all doubts that the Hindus consider Shudars a progeny of evil spirits. Scholars of ancient Indian history are in agreement that it is so. Some of the references are copied here. Raghuzan writes this is to differentiate between the Aryans and non Aryans, we are aware of the former, of the later we have reached the conclusion that they were the local non-Aryan inhabitants and none else. These were the people that the Aryan immigrants found, when they came to India. These were the people brought down after extended warfare, to a very ignoble condition. There is very little doubt that it is here that the caste formation initially started. The present-day division of Hindus into Dawei and Shudras bears a striking resemblance to the original differentiation. Apart from all else, the word Waran has been used in the context of racism, in the Sanskrit language. Later on, we will see that this differentiation or discrimination, based on color, of the fair-skinned Aryans and dark-skinned Shudars, has been oft repeated in the Vedic poems. The word Dasyu, with the many changes it has undergone, tells us a tale in itself. This is an ancient Aryan word, which the Persians used in its original meaning, to depict race or nationality. In India, it took over the meaning of enemy in the Arabic language too, the usage of the word nation, without qualification, often depicts enemy nation. Then the word easily assumed the meaning of evil spirits or ghosts in the Vedic discourses of the supernatural, and generally, it began denoting the evil forces of darkness and those that cause famine. Indra was always ready to combat these evil forces with the powers of light. This adoption of the meaning by the word Dasyu, though natural and logical, creates some difference in understanding the Vids. Wherever, in Vedic words, Inder is requested to rid the Aryans of the Dasyus, and to kill them or where it is stated that, Inder put an end to the Dasyus, it is often difficult to determine whether the real or the imagined enemy is indicated. In the last adoption of meaning, the word just indicated a servant or slave. 
with a little alteration of the word itself, it became das. In this way, the process of changes in the word indicates to us the Aryan journey to victory over the locals. The word itself continued its progress, until it reached close in meaning to the word shudar. Accordingly, the correct sequence of the social division follows the following pattern Aryans Dasius de Wei Shudars if further evidence is required to confirm that the Shudar race was made a caste of servants through conquest, we should refer to the collection of laws of Manu. In Manu's laws, it is declared that a Dewei under no condition should accept the servitude of a Shudar, though the Shudar be a Raja. In this, the Shudar Raja can be no other than of local origin. Although the words, Aryan Dasyu, or De, follow a correct pattern, it is incorrect to assume that Shudars or Dasius were any particular race. The usage follows the same pattern, under which all races that were not Roman or Greek were termed as barbarians. Vedic India page 282-285 Professor Rapson writes the authors of Rig Ved were not aware of any finer meanings of race and nationality. They only knew that there were different castes of humans. The religious caste known as Brahmans, the ruling and fighting caste known as Kashtris, the tillers of land, known as Vesh and the servant class known as Shudars. There was a huge gap between the first and the last class. The highest class is of Brahmans and the lowest that of the Shudars. The difference between these is in color wherein. Generally the Aryans were fair colored and the Dasius dark colored. Cambridge, History of India, Volume I, page 54. D. R. Bradle writes the big difference between the Aryans and the Dasius was in color. One of the main factors behind a Hindu caste system is the Arya Waran and the dark color. The overpowering of the dark-skinned and forcing them into subservience, was one of the most important undertakings of the Hindus. Although the Vids mention wars and advances against the Dasius and the capturing of new lands, but it is confirmed that the total eradication of the locals, was not attempted. Some of the local inhabitants fled into the mountains of the northwest, and took refuge there, but others who remained there were enslaved. Cambridge, History of India, Volume 1, page 8486 Professor Hopkins writes the Shudar slaves had been accepted as a part of the total social structure. The name itself indicates that they were a part of a conquered nation. Just as the word carrion, came to mean slave, in ancient Athens, similarly the word shudar assumed the meaning of slave. The shudars however were not exempt from the class of human beings. They came to be included in the domestic affairs of the home and were also included in certain domestic functions. Cambridge, History of India, Volume 1, page 234. The same writer later writes if we compare Gotham's ruling 1222 on the case, where an Aryan woman has an illicit relation with a Shudar man, with the ruling of Aps Chumdharam Shastar, 226, 20, 27, and 9, we find ample proof of the belief that the Aryans were a superior race to the dark-colored people. Mr. Kataher has been a little irresponsible in his book, The History of Divisions in India, where he states there appears to, be no difference between the Aryans and Dravidians. It is true that those people, who were expelled from their castes and their society, were thereafter not called Aryans. Conversely, no Shudar has ever become an Aryan. The Aryan race, has since the period of Rig Ved till much later, been the proponents of this racial discrimination. Cambridge, History of India page 246 From studying these pieces of evidence, it becomes amply clear that, in the Hindu religion, those who have been termed as Shudars are actually the vanquished non-Aryan nations. Therefore, the laws prescribed for them in the books of Hindu religious code and the attitude of the Hindu religion in their connection is the attitude of the conqueror in relation to the vanquished. Point to Judaism a distinct advantage of examining the laws dealing with warfare in Judaism is that unlike in Hinduism, we have to consult just one book, the Torah, to get the required information and to see the true nature of the religion. At the time when the original book was written, Judaism had not attained the status of the religion of any state worldwide for many centuries. However, after the creation of the Jewish state of Israel, 
much of what Syed Mahdudi has analyzed in the following sections with regards to Judaism have become much more relevant, more so in view of the continued aggressive military assertion of Israel since its formation. Many books have been written by Jewish scholars in the compilation of their jurisprudence. Among those, renowned ones are Akiba bin Yusuf S. Mishnah and Midrash of the 2nd century AD, Talmud, which is a combination of Mishnah and Gumarah, of the 6th century AD, Isaac Alfasa S. Holocos, which was written in the 11th century AD, and is considered the best book on Talmudic law, Musa Mamuni S. Mishnah Torah, which was written towards the end of the 12th century AD, Yaqub ben Asher Stur of the 14th century AD and Yusuf Karo S. Joel Khan Aruk, written in the 16th century AD, in which all laws and benedictions have been compiled in accordance with the old traditions. Nevertheless, the critical analysis of the material in these books is not of much benefit, since none of these is acceptable to all sects of Jews and none, which may be considered the foundation of Judaism. In fact, the Jews themselves have expressed their dissatisfaction with them and except for Torah itself, the generality of Jews do not accept all the books. In July 1906, the Central Committee of American Jewish Rubies, in its congregation in Indianapolis, openly expressed their resentment and protested against following the varied doctrines of their religion. Therefore, to avoid ambiguity, ignoring all these books, we will place our dependence regarding the Jewish concepts of war, on the Torah itself 23. Causes of war mention of war is plenty in the Torah and war has been ordered quite frequently. However, apart from the one cause espoused by the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 2 and the book of Numbers chapter 33, none other can be detected. On the plains of Moab by Jordan across from Jericho, the Lord said to Musa speak to the Israelites and say to them when you cross the Jordan into Canaan, drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you. Destroy all their carved images and their cast idols, and demolish all their high places. Take possession of the land and settle in it, for I have given you the land to possess Book of Numbers, 33 50 54 The book is this not Deuteronomy further states set out now and cross the Arnon Gorge. See I have given in your hands, Mori Sihon, the Amorite king of Heshbon and his country. Begin to take possession of it and engage in battle Deuteronomy, 224 But Sihon king of Heshbon refused to let us pass through. For the Lord your God had made his spirit stubborn and his heart obstinate in order to give him into your hands, as he has now done. The Lord said to me, See I have begun to deliver Sihon and his country over to you. Now begin to conquer and possess his land. When Sihon and all his army came out to meet us in battle at Hahaz, the Lord our God delivered him over to us and we struck him down, together with his sons and his whole army. At that time, we took all his towns and destroyed them completely men, women, and children. We left no survivors. But the livestock and the plunder from the towns we had captured we carried off for ourselves Deuteronomy 2 30 35 Next we turned and went up along the road toward Bashan, and Og king of Bashan with his whole army marched out to meet us in battle at Adri. The Lord said to me, Do not be afraid of him, for I have handed him over to you with his whole army and his land. Do to him what you did to Sihon king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon. So the Lord our God also gave into our hands Og, king of Bashan and all his army. We struck them down, leaving no survivors. At that time we took all his cities we destroyed them completely, as we had done with Sihon, king of Heshbon, destroying every city men, women, and children. But all the livestock and the plunder from their cities we carried off for ourselves. Deuteronomy 317 From these it is apparent that the cause espoused and made permissible by Torah is the gaining of sovereignty over lands, overpowering its inhabitants, by dint of the sword and based on the right, is of the more powerful, taking over and establishing their rights over the belongings, property, and even the lives of the less powerful. In its sight, this very same terrorism and subjugation forms the basis of the inheritance of God's earth, promised to the Bani Israel Israelites. In contrast to this the Quran states, My righteous slaves shall inherit the earth 21105, at another place it states, The earth is Allah's he giveth it for an inheritance to whom he wills. And lo! 
the sequel is for those who keep their duty unto him 7128 this concept of inheritance is primarily different from the concept put forward by the Torah. Whereas the Torah declares the Israelites alone are the inheritors of the earth, the Quran does not make it the heritage of any particular people but declares that it is reserved for the righteous only. Whereas, the Torah's concept of inheritance of land comprises the conquest of a nation, usurping its lands, property, lives, and respect of its people and after destroying it, becoming the masters of the lands themselves. The Quranic concept is different. According to it, a particular group will be chosen for the vicegerency of the world, because of the righteousness of its conduct. Such a nation would rid the world of cruelty and strife and in its place, establish a system of law and justice. As stated, according to Torah, the inheritance of the earth comprises of the subjugation conquest of other nations, which translates into expansionism alone. The true cause for war outlined in the Torah, conceptually, therefore, in contrast to the Islamic Jihad Faisabil Illa, is the acquisition of wealth and the establishment of the superiority of one particular nation over others. Limitations of where we do not find much detail regarding the limitations and rules of warfare in the Torah, but we do find the treatment the Jewish religion recommends for the enemies. On the subject, the book of Deuteronomy states when you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to sword all men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves. And you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from the enemy's Deuteronomy, 2010 141 However, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, do not leave alive anything that breathes, completely destroy them 2016 17 When you lay siege to a city for a long time, fighting against it to capture it, do not destroy its trees by putting an axe on them, because you can eat their fruit 2019 And when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them, and show them no mercy 7 to break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles and burn their idols in the fire 7 5 These are the decrees and laws you must be careful to follow in the land that the Lord your God of your fathers, has given you to possess as long as you live in the land. Destroy completely all the places on the high mountains and on the hills and under every spreading tree where the nations you are dispossessing worship their gods. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones and burn the Asherah poles in the fire, cut down the idols of their gods and wipe out their names from those places. 12 2, 3 The book Kuruj Exodus states Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Emeritus, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty with those who live in the land where you are going or that will be a snare among you. Break down their altars, Smash their sacred stone and cut down their Asherah poles 34 1113 The book aided book of Numbers states the Lord said to Moses, Take vengeance on Midianites for the Israelites. After that, you will be gathered to your people so Moses said to the people, Arm some of your men to go to war against the Midianites and to carry out the Lord's vengeance on them. Send into battle a thousand men from each of the tribes of Israel. So twelve thousand men armed for battle, a thousand from each tribe were supplied from the clans of Israel. They fought against Midian, as the Lord commanded Moses, and killed every man the Israelites captured the Midianites' women and children and took all the Midianites' herds, flocks, and goods as plunder. They burned all the towns where the Midianites had settled, as well as all their camps. They took all the plunder and spoils, including the people and animals, and brought the captives, spoils, and plunder to Moses and Eliezer the priest and the Israelites' assembly at their camp on the plains of Moab, by the Jordan across from Jericho Moses was angry with the officers of the army the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds who returned from the battle. Have you allowed all the women to live? He asked them now kill all the boys and kill every woman who has slept with a man, 
but save for yourselves every girl who has not slept with a man 31 1 18 the book Joshua states they devoted to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it men and women, young and old, cattle sheep and donkeys then they burned the whole city and everything in it, but they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house Joshua, 2 21 25 but they took the king of Ai alive and brought him to Joshua. When Israel had stopped killing all the men of Ai, in the fields and in the desert, where they had chased them, and when every one of them had been put to the sword, all the Israelites returned to Ai and killing those who were in it. Twelve thousand men and women fell that day all the people of Ai. For Joshua did not draw back the hand that held out his javelin until he had destroyed all who lived in Ai. But Israel did carry off for themselves the livestock and plunder of the city, as the Lord had instructed Joshua 8:23-27 from the foregoing, it is apparent that the Jewish religion divides its enemies into two kinds. One, who have not been placed in the Jewish heritage, the others are those who have been placed in their rightful heritage. The dealings with both these types of enemies follow different patterns. Regarding the first kind, there is the provision that, before inflicting war on them, they will be given the option to either sue for peace or fight. If they sue for peace and hand over their country to the Israelites, they will be awarded the responsibility of serving them the Israelites. However, if they opt for war, after victory has been achieved, all male members of the enemy should be put to death, all their women and children enslaved and all their property confiscated. Cutting down or otherwise harming trees and crops is however forbidden, not in the interest of avoidance of strife, but, for they would be of use to the victors later. The laws regarding the second type of enemy are such that they deprive them of all human rights and afford them very few privileges. Regarding them Torah's law is, that war should be declared against them outrightly and no truce should be entered into with them. Their buildings and places of worship should be raised, their women, children, and even their domestic animals should be put to the sword. Such destruction should be unleashed on the enemy, that the civilization is totally exterminated. The justification given is, that the Torah requires, the nations in their heritage, should be completely destroyed and they should not be offered any conditions, accepting which, may enable them to live. These teachings are self-explanatory. Moreover, the manifest demonstration of the philosophy and the actions of Israel, vis vis Palestine, even in the 21st century are distinct examples of the same point three Buddhism we have so far studied the concepts of warfare, in religions, where it is held permissible. The differences that Islam has with these, are not because of the permissibility factor, but are purely of the ethical and practical nature. The other type of religions comprise of those, which consider war totally impermissible. Islam has been censured by these religions, for permitting it. In the historical order, Buddhism comes first in the list. The basics of Buddhism before proceeding into the discussion of the ways of Buddhism, we must understand that we have no way of finding out what actually were the teachings of Buddha or whatever we acknowledge today as Buddhism is really based on his teachings, as Buddha did not reduce his sayings into writing. He neither wrote a book in his lifetime nor had left the beliefs and rules regarding his religion in written form, so that his followers could learn his religion in his own words. History tells us that even after Buddha, none of his disciples attempted to write down his sayings. Some traditions however reveal that in his morning kingdom, a huge meeting was held, in which one or two of his specially favored disciples delivered lectures on his teachings. However, for one, it cannot be historically proven that such a meeting did actually take place, and even if it did, the lectures in this meeting were not recorded for the progeny. The best available source that describes the events that took place in Buddha's lifetime and a little later is the Mahaparnayaban Suttar. This is also silent about the Grand Council Buddha Sutra page X1 X111. The present books of the Buddhist religion were all authored long after Buddha. A century after he died, a council of scholars and religious leaders was held in Vasali and after great discussion, the rules, principles, and laws of Buddhism were enacted or an attempt was made to compile them. However, regarding these, the writer of Depo Massey states, 
that the Buddhist priests' pitches changed the real principles of the religion. Some changes were made even in Buddha's sayings and some new sayings were introduced. Max Muller, Sacred Books of the Buddhists, preface this is the period when Buddhist teachings started being reduced to writing. The process continued until 1 BCIE for about 400 years. Again, it had to face a revision, to the extent that even the basics of the religion underwent changes. In the primary concept of Buddhism, there was no mention of God. Now an everlasting entity was introduced, whose physical manifestation was Buddha. In the initial concept, there was no concept of heaven and hell but it was now introduced, good deeds would take a person to heaven and evil deeds to hell. Initially the rules for leading a pious life were very stringent, but now they were softened in consideration of necessities. This last change occurred in the period of Kanishka, which was around 1 AD history tells us that a council was held on the behest of Kanishka in Kashmir. In that council, with alterations and changes, new laws of Buddhism were enacted Hakman, Buddhism as a Religion page 5155. A small group rejected the modern laws, however, the majority of the Buddhists accepted them. Those who accepted the revision formed a sect of Buddhism, which came to be known as Mahayana. It is apparent from the above, that what in the real sense can be termed as the religious book of Buddhists, is in all probability, missing from Buddhism. We cannot, for certain satisfy ourselves, as to what the teachings of Buddha really were. At the maximum, we can place our reliance on the books that escaped Kanishka's revisionism and reached us. These are three in number one. Vinapetak, which is a collection of laws and rules, following which, a man can attain piety. These were compiled between 350 BC and 250 BC during different periods. However, the author or authors of these cannot be identified. Two Sut Petak, which is a collection of the sayings of Buddha, that lay down the means of achieving salvation, i.e. they deal with the ethical philosophy of Buddhism. Unfortunately, even in this case, history does not convey to us the identity of the author. 3. Abhidham Petak, this too deals mostly with the philosophy of Buddhism. The only thing known about this book is that it was in existence prior to the end of 3 BC. For further details consult Professor Hess David S. Holy Books of the East, Volume 11. Whatever is written in the following pages is based on the teachings of Buddhism, conveyed to us through these books and not on his real teachings, which we have no means of knowing. The teachings of Ahansa Buddhism is a religion that follows the dictates of Ahansa. In this, every living thing has been considered innocent and for the human being, the smallest insect has been considered worthy of respect. No living thing may be aggressed on under any circumstance. The first of the Ten Commandments of Buddha is, do not kill anything, the person who does so is guilty of an unforgivable sin Vinya texts, volume 1, page 46. The limit is that for three months of the rainy season, a person is forbidden to step out of his home, since if he does so, he might kill some minute insect Vinya texts, volume 1, page 298-301. Under the influence of these strict rules of Ahansa, let alone permitting war, even thinking of it appears criminal. Where the respect for life is so heightened, the religion must be inclined towards treating such acts with disgust, that involve killing, not of insects but of thousands or tens of thousands of men. For that reason, Buddha does not permit a Buddhist to witness the bloodshed of battles, even as a spectator. Paiktia Dharma Clause 48 states, the follower who without due cause, goes to witness an army readied for war has sinned clauses 49 and 50 state the follower, who has a reason, to go where an army is ready for war, may stay there for a maximum of 3-4 days and if he stays there 2 or 3 nights and witnesses soldiers in the battlefield, or the roll call of the soldiers, or arraigning of soldiers in battle order or the inspection of troops, he will be guilty of sin Vinya texts volume 1. Page 43 The philosophy of Buddha from these orders, Buddha's point of view regarding war is obvious. However, to fully judge the concept, only knowing about these orders is not enough, it is necessary that we understand the philosophy in its entirety of which, 
Ahinsa is just a part. Ahinsa, in fact, is just one of the many means that Buddha has chosen to mold humanity in accordance with his wishes. The means are useful in leading men in the direction he has chosen, we need therefore to examine, the countenance of, what Buddha wishes humanity to acquire, the way he wishes men to follow, the end to which he wishes to lead men, his aim, and the means he wishes to utilize for the attainment of this aim. Without understanding all these factors, grasping the real meaning of Ahinsa and its deep effect on humanity would be difficult. Buddha's perspective of life is far removed from that of other scholars and intellectuals. He has not concerned himself with the cause and reason for man's being on earth and his purpose of life. It makes sense therefore, that he has not addressed the question of the right way for man, towards his and his progeny's true well-being, he has concentrated entirely on trying to understand the oppression and revolutions that affect man's life. The factors of oppression which are operative in the many changes like childhood, youth, aging, good health, sickness, birth, death, sorrow, happiness, content, and frustration, and the ways to overcome the oppressiveness of each change and tumult. He considers that these are the only questions worthy of attention and has totally ignored all other temporal and religious affairs of man's life. After much contemplation, Buddha reached the conclusion that life itself is a sufferance that man is subject to, from his birth to death. His existence is totally purposeless and if at all there is a purpose, it is his tolerance of suffering and pain. The world is no place for man to live in. Here, behind every satisfaction, there is a frustration, behind every happiness, there is a sadness, and behind every birth, there is a death. All this tumult dislocation and oppression is under the influence of a universal plan, which in itself is oppression. Buddha states that the reason for man being subject to this oppression is his own desire, consciousness, and cognizance. These forces of ego, establish a man's link with the material world and this same link brings man repeatedly back in this world. In every reincarnation, he gets a new body to live in and every time he has to live a different emotional and intellectual life and until he remains under the yoke of his desires, he has to undergo the torments of birth, life, and death repeatedly. Buddha states that the only way of avoidance of this suffering is through nirvana a state of rest and freedom from desire. He explains that when life is oppression and the cause of this suffering is human desire, then pure contentment is only in his complete freedom from desire and in the end of this worldly life, leading to oneness with the spirit of the universe. This state can only be achieved through severance of all relations with the material world, self-denial of all longings, feelings, and pleasures. Man should reach a frame of mind, in which he has no attraction for anything material. He is cleansed of all emotions, feelings, and desires, in such a way that he does not acknowledge any connection with the world, which would have been the cause of his reincarnation in this world. In the way he would free himself form the bonds of his being, thus achieving freedom from temporal existence and complete freedom from desire. This is Nirvana 24 and according to Buddha, is or should be the ultimate aim of man. Finally, the question is, how can a man achieve the state of Nirvana 25? At this point Buddhism acquires a practical aspect and outlines eight aims of life, for the achievement of Nirvana. One correctness of belief, i.e. understanding fully, the four basic truths. Two correctness of aims in life, i.e. making firm resolutions to give up all pleasures of life and total avoidance of hurting or harming other people and creatures. Three correctness of speech, i.e. avoidance of speaking or listening to rash speech, falsehood, and discussions of others' ills. For correctness of behavior, i.e. avoidance of depravity, murder, and misappropriation. 5. Correctness of economy, i.e. earning one's livelihood through fair and permissible means. 6. Correctness of effort, i.e. striving honestly towards following the dictates of belief. 7. Correctness of remembrance, i.e. remembering one's past actions. 8. Correctness of thought i.e. without the consideration of pleasures of life and personal satisfaction, striving towards achievement of nirvana. For the achievement of these eight aims, Buddha has outlined ten means. Of these ten means commandments, five are mandatory in nature, while five are de rigueur. 
these are given below. 1. Do not kill. 2. Do not steal. 3. Do not indulge in illicit sex. 4. Do not lie. 5. Do not consume alcohol or other intoxicants. 6. Do not eat except at the appointed time. 7. Avoid music and other pleasurable activities like games, plays, etc. 8. Avoid use of perfumes and other scented stuff. 9. Avoid sleeping on soft beds. 10. Avoid being in possession of gold or silver. These eight aims and ten means or commandments, form the ethical foundation of Buddhism. The ethical cornerstone of all instructions given by Buddha is self-denial and forsaking the world, his ultimate aim, being the achievement of nirvana, which is not possible without sacrificing the ego. Therefore, for erasing the ego factor from human consideration, he has prescribed many stringent exercises. Some of these are plucking out all the hair from one's beard, mustaches, and head, so that the conceit of beauty is erased, always being in the standing position, lying down on beds of thorns or nails, always maintaining the same posture during sleep, rubbing dust on one's body, and other such painful exercises that seek to make man accustomed to self-denial. Apart from the above, Buddha has instructed with equal severity on the conduct of daily routine affairs. It is not possible to go into details of all the instructions here, since it would require several volumes. A few however are mentioned here for the benefit of the reader 26. The four things for which man has been advised strict avoidance are a sex 27b theft, even of a single blade of grass sea killing on purpose, even the smallest insect de affecting apparel etc. to indicate one's superiority over others 28 after a person adopts a religious life, he may not wear new clothes. He may only wear clothes made of discarded cloth gathered from refuse bins or from coffin cloth in which a dead person has been buried. Even such clothes, in his possession, should not exceed three in number. He should be mostly unemployed, roaming from place to place, begging for his food. Such livelihood from beggary is the purest of all 29. He should not make or own a house but should live in the jungles, in the shelter of trees. If he falls ill, he should use no medicine, auto urine therapy is the best medication for him. Vinya Texts, Part 1, Page 173-174 He should not attempt to keep himself clean. He is permitted to have a bath, once in two weeks at the most. Vinya Texts, Part 1, Page 44 He should not have any money in his possession. He should avoid trade, business etc., which involve transactions of gold or silver. Vinya Texts, Part 1, Page 2627 He should not even own a comfortable bed, a coarse and old blanket should be good enough for him and should last him a minimum of six years. Vinya Texts, Part 1, P2425 The true weakness of Buddhism in the foregoing, we have stated the ethics of Buddhism. Ahinsa is just a part of these. In this philosophy, without doubt there are some excellent ethical instructions. It would be an injustice, if we proceed without praising the piety and abstinence that Buddhism preaches and which Buddha practiced in his venerable life. However, despite its many good qualities, in principle, the entire system is wrong and so is the way it prescribes for reaching its goals. After seeing the changes in life, its revolutions, and turmoil, Buddha appears to be stunned by them, both at individual and collective levels, he has failed to understand the cause of all these and does not go much into their depth to uncover the actual truth. He does not prescribe that man bravely endeavor to combat them and strive towards the final goal. Instead, he summarily glances through them and reaches the conclusion that there is absolutely no reason for man's existence, that all affairs of the world are meaningless, that there is no cause and reason for the collective and individual changes in the world and that they are purely for the purpose of causing pain and agony to man. Human intelligence, feelings, understanding, awareness, emotions, physical prowess and whatever else has been gifted to man, have no better purpose than to cause trouble, discomfort, and pain. He states that world's wealth, culture, society, politics, governance, trade, and in fact, all its activities have no purpose but to establish man's links with the material world. 
this in turn becomes the reason for his reincarnations in the world, repeatedly. Man should have no other aim and objective in life, but to remain cut off from all relations of the world, except with his own self and even regarding his own self, he should keep away from all pleasures, being in a continual state of endurance, hardship, and pain. To the extent that he frees himself from the bondage of being, ego and desire, thereby reaching the state of not being, total death and absorption in the spirit of the universe. Obviously, the person who, being afraid of the turmoil of life, abandons the world, severs all collective and individual ties with it, concerning himself only with his own deliverance and even for the purpose chooses the route, that takes him not through the world but from outside of it, such a person cannot be expected to strive, fearlessly for his country and nation, family, and progeny. He cannot be expected to utilize his emotional, physical, and intellectual capabilities to exploit his possessions and wealth, for the betterment of the society. He cannot be capable of ridding the society of cruelty, enmity, strife, turmoil, arrogance, and evil and establishing in its stead, law, and justice and raising the banner of truth. He cannot be expected to combat with bravery the difficulties that attend naturally, each of man's undertakings. 30 The striving, the heat of activity, the bravery, and manliness, the sinister problems of the battlefield, the hurts and injuries of the sword, the politics, and governance, the burden of responsibilities etc., can only be borne by the person who considers that he has come into the world for a purpose, who has high aspirations, who considers that he fulfills an important role in the world and that he is answerable to a supreme being. Only he, who has firm belief that whatever he does in this life will bear fruit in the eternal life, can bear all this, not the wretched person, frustrated by life, dissatisfied with the results of his life work, sad at all that is happening around him, fearful of accidents of the world, cowed down by every problem, afraid of all revolutions, hiding in the lap of death and praying for his eternal termination. How can the poor wretch be expected to bear the burden of responsibilities? It cannot be expected that he would unnecessarily commit himself to the hardships of jihad and war of politics and kingship. That person has already forsaken the world and its turmoil and made the attainment of death and eternal death his aim in life. Why would such a person, enter the arena of the world ready for action and waste his time in its administration, whose life he consider a meaningless waste of time? 31 Buddhism S. A. Hansa, is not fulfilling worldly responsibilities and then declaring war as unnecessary. It is, in fact forsaking the world totally. It therefore, naturally has no concern with war and no concern with the sword, since it cannot aid its follower in attaining his aims. These are a Buddhist mystic's limit of foresight. The effects of Ahinsa on the followers of Buddhism teachings of Buddha have never acquired a position of strength or a separate culture. It has never been able to overcome a culture and establish its own. Whatever country it reached, it was only able to leave a negative effect on the ethics of its society and has never been able to affect its system of politics or culture and establish a better one. There was not even an attempt in the direction. Without doubt its teachings reached far and wide, the East, Middle East and the Far East, all benefited from it. The acceptance and popularity it achieved is unmatched. Today its number of followers is greater than all other religions. There are however, no examples in history of any revolutionary changes it brought about in a nation or that it became a reason for any outstanding achievement. Conversely, whenever it was pitted against a different power or culture, it failed. India, which is the birthplace of the Buddhist religion, was almost totally Buddhist in the first century AD, in 3 AD 3 4 of the population still followed Buddhism. However, after 4 AD, when the Brahmanic religion started its influence, within three centuries, it succumbed to it. Today, out of a population of 3.5 billion, there are hardly 300,000 to 400,000, Buddhists there at the time this book was originally written. In Afghanistan, similarly, Buddhism gained much popularity under the auspices of Ashoka and spread far and wide. In 2 AD, the king of Kabul, Minander, or Melinda, himself converted to Buddhism. However, 
when Buddhism came in opposition to the power and culture of Islam, it could not withstand the impact, even for a little while. Smith, Early History of India in China, Whatever stability was the lot of Buddhism was because of its alignment with Taoism. Else, the religion of Confucius had almost brought an end to the Buddhist religion there. In Japan, it had to compromise much, to reach an understanding with Shintoism. It even had to compromise on its principal beliefs in the contest Hackman, Buddhism as a Religion, page 1991. In the rest of the countries, like Ceylon Sri Lanka of today, Burma Myanmar of today and Tibet, there was no influence or power, it had to contest against and therefore it was easy for Buddhism to spread there. However, it is evident from history that it could never influence their cultural life in any way. They remained as lifeless and ineffectual as they were before. Above all else, it is an uncontroversial fact that Buddhism never attempted to stand up against any government or dared to reform any society. It does not play even a minor role in the politics of any nation. It has never attempted to participate in a government or to change it. Instead, it has espoused acceptance of all governments whether they are cruel and oppressive, or just vinya texts, part 1, page 301. Buddhism has even gone to the length of responding to the satanic powers with humility and to cruelty with acceptance. Its teachings have instilled in its followers a tolerance, similar to that of a lover, that they cannot even utter a cry in the face of extremes of cruelty. It is their firm belief that the debacles of life are a direct result of a person's sins, which he may have committed in his past incarnation. For the reason, if a person faces cruelty and hardships, he should not consider the perpetrator responsible, but himself. That he is receiving the treatment because of sins, he may have committed in his earlier life. This religious belief, serves to calm down the emotions of vengefulness and self-esteem and in their stead, infuse a willing tolerance of insult and injury. Obviously, for any despotic government, nothing can be more desirable than a nation of men, of the qualities that Buddha prescribes. Such people, instead of being a source of danger to the government, seek to lend it stability. They can be subjected to all kinds of cruel laws, heavy taxation, unfair appropriation of wealth, their life property and honor can easily be usurped, and they can be used in all ways to satisfy the satanic idiosyncrasies of the rulers. This is the reason that Buddhism did not face any conflict with any ruler or government. In fact, many countries, instead of opposing it, bestowed upon it their favor. As soon as Buddha started preaching, the Raja of Bimbasara gave him succor and promulgated a declaration in favor of his preaching Vinya texts, Part 1, page 136-197. Later, his son, Ajatsutro, also remained a follower of Buddhism and its firm supporter. Kosala S. Rajapas Nadi Agni Dude, invited Buddha to his kingdom, accepted his religion and in order to further ties with him, married a girl from the Ashaka family. Buddhist India, page 1011. Apart from these, we find that Raja of Antipat, of Sura Sanyas and Raja Ilayo became disciples of Buddha. After this period, we find that in 3 BC, Ashoka sponsored Buddhism and using all his regal means, caused the religion to spread not only in India and its neighbors but also to the far-off countries Buddhist India, page 16. In the 1st century BC Kanishka, was a wholehearted supporter of Buddhism. Vikramajit I, though himself a follower of the Brahmanic religion, supported and strengthened Buddhism. Then in 7 AD when Raja Haresh Singh came to power, he supported Buddhism with such fervor that Brahmanic stalwarts started plotting his murder smith, Early History of India, page 349. Outside India, in Tibet and Mongolia, Kublai Khan found it politically sound to spread Buddhism and made all efforts to do so Buddhism as a religion, page 7374. In China, King Mintii, invited Buddhist preachers and welcomed their religion most fervently. This support and sponsorship continued until much later. Buddhism continued to spread and survived centuries of turmoil in many countries. This was not because of its inherent strength or its capability of survival, 
rather because it bowed to every cruel leadership, never dared to oppose cruelty and never even attempted to free humanity of the arrogance and despotism of any rule. For that reason, all rulers found it politic to favor and support it. From this brief analysis of Buddhism, the difference in the perspectives of war in it and in Islam will be amply clear. Islam believes that man has come into this world for a specific purpose. His deliverance is dependent on his good conduct in the world. For that reason, it prescribes actions, which are beneficial for his and his posterity's material and ethical well-being, the actions necessary to promote order in his worldly life. On the other hand, Buddhism describes life as meaningless and states that the man's salvation is in the severance of all worldly ties, to the extent of ignoring his own self. For that purpose it does not permit him any act or striving, in the direction, that would lead him towards establishing links or relations with anything worldly. It is now, for one to decide whether the jihad of Islam or ahimsa of Buddhism is more beneficial for humanity. Point for Christianity the other religion that has fundamental difference with Islam on the question of war is Christianity. Like in the case of Judaism, we need only to consult one book to get all the information we require for our purpose. That book is the Bible, the fundamental book of the Christian religion 32. Before addressing the question at hand and referring to Bible, to seek its guidance, it is necessary to understand that the condition Bible is in today can only reveal to us the beliefs of the Christians of today. We cannot judge from present-day Bible as to what the original teachings of Isa as were. To understand the later arguments in this chapter, it is necessary that we keep in consideration, this factor of authenticity. The examination of the authenticity of the biblical presentations before proceeding further, therefore, is in order. Investigation of the biblical books today. The collection that we know as Bible consists of four books Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. However, none of these is of Isa as. Unlike the Quran, each verse and each word of which is revealed to the Prophet Muhammad saw, we do not find that which was revealed to Isa as, consolidated at any one place. Then again, we do not find even the revelations of God to Isa as and his sermons, in his own words. These books are neither the word of God nor that of Isa as. They are in fact, the books written by the disciples or the students of disciples of Isa as, who according to their own knowledge and understanding compiled them. The four books are so far removed from the original Majahul ul Asal, that much dependence cannot be placed on their authenticity. The first book Matthew is attributed to Matthew, a disciple of the prophet Isa as. His actual book known as Logia is not traceable. The book attributed to him, was actually written by some unknown author, who consulted Logia along with other books for the purpose. Matthew has been grammatically referred to in the third person and not in the first person, in his book 33. After reading Matthew, it appears that it has been mostly adapted from the Bible of Mark. If Matthew had himself been its author, there was no necessity for him to consult the book of the author who neither had been the disciple of nor ever met Isa as. Some Christian scholars believe that the book was written in 70 AD, others believe it was written in 90 AD. The second book is attributed to Mark. It is generally believed that Mark was in fact, the author of the book. Nevertheless, it is proven that Mark never met Isa as and that he was never his disciple. Some say that he was present at the crucifixion of Jesus Isa as, but even this is not proven. He was in fact the disciple of St. Peter. Whatever he heard from St. Peter, he wrote it down in Greek. For that reason, Christian writers refer to him as St. Peter's scribe. Mark's Bible is believed to have been written between 63 AD and 70 AD. The third book is ascribed to Luke. It is established that Luke never met Isa as, and that he never benefited from his teachings, in the first hand. He was a disciple of St. Paul and was constantly in his company. His Bible consists of what he St. Paul quotes from the sayings of Isa as. For that reason, St. Paul refers to Luke's Bible as his own. It however is an established fact that St. Paul himself was never in the company of Isa as. He, according to Christian traditions entered the folds of Christianity, six years after the crucifixion of Isa as. Therefore, 
one link between Luke and Isa as is missing. Even the date of the authorship of St. Luke's Bible is unconfirmed. Some say that it was written in 57 AD, while others claim that it was written in 74 AD. Hornick, Griffith, and Plummer are of the opinion that it could not have been written before 80 AD. The fourth book is John. Modern investigations prove that he was not the disciple John who wrote it, but it was some other person whose name also happened to be John. The book was written much after Isa as, in 90 AD, Hornick dates it to 110 AD, obviously, none of these books can be linked to Isa as and their authenticity cannot be proved. 34 On closer examination, the questionability of their authenticity increases. Firstly, all the four Bibles differ from each other, to the extent that the Sermon of the Mount which is the basis of all Christian teachings, is stated differently and contradictorily in three of the Bibles, i.e. Matthew, Mark, and John. Secondly, the thinking of their authors is clearly evident. The addressees of Matthew appear to be Jews. Matthew appears to be speaking to them argumentatively. The addressees of Luke appear to be Romans whom he wishes to educate about the Israelites. Additionally, Luke advocates the cause of St. Paul and wishes to prove him of a higher stature than the other disciples of Isa as. John appears to be influenced by the philosophies and mysticism that had spread amongst the Christians towards the end of the first century AD with all that, the difference in concept appears to have surpassed in importance, the difference in wordings. Thirdly, all these Bibles have been written in the Greek language, although the language of all the disciples and of Isa as himself was Hebrew Suryani. With the change in language, the depicted thought pattern also has chances of undergoing change. Fourthly, it was only in the 2nd century AD, that attempts were made to reduce Bible into writing. Until 150 AD, it was thought that verbal traditions were better than writings. Towards the end of 2nd century AD, it was decided to write down the Bible. The Bibles of that era, however, are not thought to be authentic. The authentic version of the New Testament was accepted by the Carthaginian Council, which met in 397 AD. Fifthly, the oldest Bible in existence in the world today dates to 4 AD. The second oldest is from 5 AD. Another one of the old Bibles, which has some mistakes, is in the library of the Pope of Rome and is not older than 4 AD. It is therefore difficult to determine how much the Bible of today resembles the Bibles in circulation in the first three centuries AD. Sixthly, it was never attempted to memorize Bible as is done in the case of Curran. Its circulation initially depended on transmission by word of mouth. In such a case, the possibility of the original text being affected by the personal thought of the one who passed on a tradition cannot be overlooked. After the period, when the Bible started being published, it was at the mercy of the copier. It was easy for the copier to edit the Bible according to his beliefs, whatever he considered in controversy to the beliefs he held, could be eliminated and whatever he considered lacking, he could add. 35 These are the reasons based on which we cannot say with certainty, that the contents of the four books of Bible are indeed the teachings of Isa as. Therefore, whatever is written in the following pages, will not be based on the Christianity preached by the prophet Isa as but the Christianity practiced by the Christians of the world of today. The teachings of love in Christianity A study of the Bible reveals that Christianity was severely opposed to the concept of war, regardless of whether war is for a rightful cause or for a wrong cause. The paramount teaching of Isa as is that after love for God, one should have love for one's neighbor Matthew, 2239. Along with this love, it is necessary that one must not be angry with one's brother. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother, will be subject to judgment Matthew 5:22. This however, is not all. The Bible does not stop at this, Matthew categorically directs that a believing Christian must show tolerance of oppression and mischief, let alone protecting others, one must not even fight for one's own rights. The most important teachings of Isa as can be found in his Sermon of the Mount. It forms the basis for Christian ethical values. In this Isa as states you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. 
and if someone wants to take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If someone forces you to go one mile go with him two miles. You have heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you love your enemies, bless those who curse you and pray for those who persecute you Matthew 5 38 44 But I tell you, who hear me love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you, if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If someone takes your cloak, do not stop him from taking your tunic. Do to others, as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them Luke 27 33 The above are the very basics of the teachings of Christianity. Its meanings are manifest in its wording itself. It clearly means that if a true Christian wishes to be perfect like his Father in heaven and whose high aim is to achieve high reward and be the sons of the Most High God, Luke 6 35, he should not in any case confront cruelty and oppression with force but should himself forego his own rights in oppressor's favor. The philosophy of ethics in Christianity the teachings of ethical philosophy cannot be fully understood until we understand the very spirit of Christianity. Christianity as we know today is a religion of mysticism, monasticism, and of complete abstinence. It does not lay down a plan for man's sociocultural life. A code of conduct, spiritual guidance, or a set of rules to be followed to lead life accordingly is not detectable in it. It does not instruct man about his duties towards himself, his family, his nation, his posterity and towards God, nor does it advise him the best way of fulfilling them. It neither instructs man as to the reasons for which the Almighty blessed him with his material wealth and his mental and physical prowess nor does it instruct them on the best way of using them. In fact, it shows a total unconcern for the problems of life. All the stress of Christianity appears to be on the question of attainment of entry into the kingdom of heavens. This question forms the core around which the entire Christian ethical philosophy is woven and is the sum total of Christ's teachings. The kingdom of heavens, however, is not a reward for man's good conduct on earth. Christianity does not accept the relation between action and reward. Actually it considers that the two are in contradiction to each other. It considers the kingdom of heavens and the kingdom of the world, two distinctly different things. The natural result of this thinking is that it prescribes different routes for attaining the two. Everything that forms a part of the kingdom of the world, is not only absent from the kingdom of heavens, but also hinders the path of achieving the latter. For that reason, Christianity instructs man, that if he desires to attain the ultimate objective, he must crush his desires for the material things of the kingdom of the world and if he cannot, he should forsake the desire for the kingdom of heavens. For the purpose, it preaches a form of mysticism and divorcing oneself from the socio-cultural activities of the material world. For clarification of the concept, some of the quotations attributed to Isa as are copied below If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters yes, even his own life he cannot be my disciple Luke 14 26 Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law Luke, 12 51 53 Freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts, take no bag for the journey, or extra tunic, or sandals, or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep Matthew, 10 8 10 Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted Luke, 12 32 33 If you want to be perfect, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, then come follow me, you will have treasure in heaven Matthew, 19 21 36 4, if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, 
your father will not forgive your sins Matthew 6 14 15 therefore I tell you do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink or about your body what you will wear is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes look at the birds of the air they do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not much more valuable than they who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life and why do you worry about clothes see how the lilies of the field grow they do not labor or spin yet i tell you that not even solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these if that is how god clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire will he not much clothe you oh you of little faith so do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear matthew 6:25-31 from these sayings of the isa as it is obvious that the object of the teachings of christianity is the complete severance of ties with the socio-cultural world we are well aware of the fact that familial relations form the foundation of society, relations of men within the society are initially dependent on the family and that their interactions, become the reason and cause for the life of humanity in general. The relations and this family life, in fact, are also the basic and the best schools for primary ethical training. However, very first victim of Isa as his family. He cuts down the first link of the chain that ties man to the society. That, which compels man's participation in the affairs of the world is his need to feed and clothe himself, but Isa as chooses to overlook this primary cause and espouses, for man, a life of the quality of that of the birds of the air and of the wild trees of the jungle. For man's satisfaction and well-being and for his collective and individual welfare, some wealth is necessary. In consideration of Jesus Isa as however, for the sake of spiritual well-being and for the attainment of the kingdom of heavens, it is necessary that one should give it up. In the world's system of justice and peace, the peace is dependent on politics and justice, on laws of punishment and the satisfaction of the aggrieved. However, Isa as states that the Father in heavens, will not forgive us for our sins, unless we fully abandon this system, based on reaction. In short, in the consideration of Isa as, being religious, in fact, is the forsaking of the world. For the one, who does not relinquish the material world, does not sever his worldly relations, does not give up the business of the world and does not take up a life of abandonment and non-concern with worldly affairs, there is no place for him in the kingdom of heavens. Man cannot at one time attain both the kingdom of heavens and the world. Attainment of both is impossible for him. Isa as states, you cannot serve God and worldly wealth at the same time. These two are opposite in nature to each other. If a man desires one, he will have to give up the other. The way this teaching of Isa as is regarded by scholars of Christianity, can be judged from the following Reverend Dimbulla in his commentary of the Bible, states in the chapter dealing with the teachings of Jesus Isa as, Christ has chosen that way of life for man which is to a great extent, different from the way preferred by the world. Instead of self-esteem and uprightness, humility, instead of fighting for one's rights, bowing down to evil, instead of seeking advancement, being content with one's lot, being happy and satisfied in piety, being humble and tolerant in difficulties are the gifts of Christianity to the world. The comprehensive description of the character of a true Christian, most probably is, that he cannot have one foot in the world and one in the church. He cannot serve God and materialism of the world at the same time. In the sight of Christ, the most compelling cause, that leads man to serve himself, is worldly wealth. Therefore, for becoming a true Christian, the first condition is that he should become unconcerned with wealth commentary on the Holy Bible, Dumelo, page lxxx. The weakness of the ethics of Christianity It is clear that in Christianity, the teachings of love, forgiveness, tolerance, and humility are the ingredients of an ethical system that forms the basis of mysticism. Since it has chosen a route for the final deliverance, that is different from that of worldly well-being, it leaves the worldly matters to worldly people and takes its religionists, 
separates them from the others, freeing them for striving to attain the kingdom of heaven. In such a religion, the fact that there is no war does not mean that it accepts the responsibility of the affairs of the world, but in their fulfillment does not consider use of force necessary. In fact, it means that since it has no concern with the affairs of the world, it finds unnecessary the effort involved in waging wars and shedding blood. It does not say that for the termination of strife, the sword is not necessary, but holds the termination of strife itself, unnecessary. It does not say that mischief can be eliminated without the use of force, but holds the elimination of mischief itself, unnecessary. It states that instead of combating mischief, one should bow one's head down in acceptance and tolerance of it. It does not say that the defense of truth and fairness against cruelty and oppression is possible without bloodshed, but that such defense itself is unnecessary, if cruelty and oppression choose to usurp one's rights, they should be allowed to do so. It does not say that criminals can be punished without violence and the aggrieved can be compensated likewise, but says, that the very system of punishment and compensation should be given up. If someone commits a crime, not seven, but seventy times, he should be forgiven each time in short, establishment of peace in the world, cleansing it of evil and mischief, establishing law and order and protecting humanity from cruelty, strife, and oppression, are out of the scope of activity of Christianity. For itself, it has chosen the life of the oppressed, the overpowered, and the downtrodden. Then, it being against war, it does not matter that it is for a right or a wrong cause, it is understandable. For the lifestyle of this choice, this is the right attitude. The question then is, whether ethical teachings of humility and tolerance can form a part of a permanent, universal law. The answer to this can be found in the teachings of Christianity itself. It has been proved that its instructions of total avoidance of war are not by themselves, permanent and isolated, but form a part of its whole mystical and esoteric philosophy, which includes, as one of its basic ingredients, the relinquishment of the material world. Therefore, the principle of avoidance of war can only come into force when the clause of relinquishing the world is fully implemented. Christianity itself does not prescribe for its followers that they should take over the administration of the world, yet stay away from war. According to its teachings, man can accept the way of humility and tolerant inaction only when he fully renounces the world and gives up its various socio-cultural responsibilities. It follows that this relinquishment, this mystical life, in fact this true Christian philosophy, is neither practically possible nor perhaps what ISA has prescribed for humanity. If Christian ethical laws were to be declared universally applicable, all humanity would have to forego all its socio-cultural activities. If attainment of the kingdom of heaven is to be man's ultimate objective in life and we accept that activities pertaining to this material world are indeed a hindrance in its path, it follows that the entire humanity, in its attempt to reach this kingdom of heaven, would avoid this obstacle. It would accept a mystical lifestyle and concentrate fully on subduing its ego and on prayers. Obviously this is not possible, the business of the entire world could close down, the people would quit striving for their livelihood and live like the birds of the air or the jungle trees. It cannot relinquish its trade, industry, agriculture and all other activities and accept a life of inaction. It cannot give up the affairs of the world and take up a monastic life. In the unlikely event, however, that all this happens, man cannot still lay claims to the respect and superiority over all creatures that God has bestowed on him. The truth is that he would cease to exist. This condition of life is possible in fertile imaginations only and not outside of them, but God forbid, if it somehow becomes a reality, it would not be the society that any sane person would idealize, aimed for, or desired of. It is therefore ridiculous and farcical to say that the laws of ethics of Christianity are viable or of universal applicability. Only that law can be said to be viable and applicable to the entire humanity, which can be followed by the entire humanity, in all events. The Christian laws seem ludicrous, not only in their universal applicability, rather are impossible even for a single nation to follow as a whole. 
supposing a nation or a state opts for it and starts following all its laws, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. It would first have to abandon its system of government, disband all its army and its police force, leave guarding its frontiers and looking after its fortresses. Then the neighboring countries, seeing no resistance, would attack it. Following the Christian teachings, this pious and God-fearing nation would not resist the mischief monger and would offer it the other cheek and along with the tunic, offer the enemy its cloak too. Moreover, it would give up all its wealth, business, houses, its shops, and even articles of the households, since, the rich cannot enter the kingdom of heaven and Isa's teaching is that, one should sell off one's belongings and give the proceeds to the poor as alms. Then it would not labor for its livelihood, factories would close down, trade would be relinquished, industry, services, and all its business persons would take refuge in monasteries. All this because the Christian teaching is that you cannot serve God and wealth at the same time and Isa as states do not worry about your life. Then there is only one option of earning a livelihood open for him and that is agriculture, that he should till the soil and grow his food. However, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, he would have to give that up too, because Isa as said, look at the birds of the air, they do not sow nor reap, even then your father in heaven feeds them. The entire nation would, in this way give up all that it owns to the attackers and become their slaves. Then the enemy would take it for forced labor and when the enemy takes it one mile for forced labor, it would go two miles. If the enemy treats the truly Christian nation cruelly, it would pray for it, if the enemy spurns them, they would ask for God's beneficence for them, when the enemy tries to usurp its honor and respect, it would offer only tolerance and acceptance in response. From Christianity's perspective, this is the ultimate in ethics. After this, nothing can stop it from attaining the kingdom of heaven. From any other intelligent man's perspective, it can be nothing but a limit of degeneracy. Striving for such an end can be nothing more than committing suicide beyond comprehension too, is the nature of this kingdom in heaven, which seeks such useless and degenerated people however, as far as this world is concerned, no nation can make this Christian law of ethics as its law of life, because it would be compelled to violate each of its clauses, in order that it may protect and provide for itself. In practice, after violating its clauses with frequency and finding it necessary to do so, it would become quite impossible for a nation to maintain its belief in it. Another possibility is that Christianity is not meant for general applicability and is not even applicable for a single nation in its entirety, but it is meant to be followed by a group in a society, as the explanation of Isa as saying suggests. In this form, it is definitely practicable. If different groups of the society continue to function, in order to fulfill the various needs of the society, i.e. different groups look after its trade, industry, agriculture, and politics etc., then it is possible, that the society can tolerate a small select group, living like the birds of the air or the wild trees of the jungle, in a state of wasteful inaction. Then only, this select group can concentrate on reaching the ultimate goal of Christianity, based on the relinquishment of the world, breaking all ties with the society and living a life of humility, tolerance, self-sacrifice and of subduing the ego. However, accepting the fact that it may be applicable for a select few and yet considering it the only way of achieving final deliverance, is accepting that only mystics and monastics have a monopoly on the kingdom of heaven. We would have to accept that the majority of humanity would have to remain deprived of a place in it. Those who are keeping the system of civilization in good order, those who are involved in providing the needs for the defense of a nation and its other necessities of life have no place, have no hope of reaching the kingdom. They are the victims of Christianity's primary belief that man cannot enter at the same time in kingdom of heaven and in the kingdom of earth. For achieving the kingdom of heaven, they would have to follow the way that Isa as suggests. In the list of those who would not enter the kingdom, are even those who abstain from forbidden sex, theft, and lies and those who respect their parents, love their neighbors as they would love themselves, but do not sell off their belongings, giving away the proceeds as alms. If we accept this belief to be true, we go back to the first possibility. However, 
if we accept that the only means of reaching the kingdom is by following the Christian code of ethics and since the entire humanity cannot follow this code as explained earlier, it follows that we will have to accept that Christianity is not meant to be of universal applicability, since the final deliverance is the objective of the entire human race. If we hold that it is the only means of achieving deliverance for the entire humanity and as has been proven, it is practically illogical and impossible for the entire human race to tread the path espoused by Christianity, which proves that it is not the route for the final deliverance of the entire humanity. Thus, we come to the conclusion that Christianity was neither meant to be followed by the entire humanity nor is it the only means of deliverance. Only that code can be termed as the everlasting and only means of deliverance, for the entire humanity, in which a king remains a king, a traitor remains a traitor, a farmer remains a farmer, and every person while fulfilling his own function, can yet remain steadfastly the follower of that code of ethics and law. That code would not be such, that in following it, man is confronted with insurmountable difficulties, unbearable hardships and unbearable dangers, trouble and pain. The code or law, which is inconsiderate of these is neither a straight and true path, nor the only route of deliverance, nor yet a true code of nature, i.e. it is unnatural. We however, cannot stop, satisfied at this. We have to go a step further and say that Christianity in its present form is entirely against human nature. It is in fact a misconception of ethical supremacy, in which some virtues have been stressed beyond moderation, while others have been unnecessarily ignored, thus rendering humanity disabled or at least severely restricted. 37. The virtues on whose acquisition Christianity stresses, are definitely unquestionable. It cannot be denied that mercy, forgiveness, softness, and tolerance are outstanding virtues. However, to construct the structure of humanity on these high qualities alone is not correct. Only in the event that the world is cleansed of all evil and mischief, angels inhabit the earth instead of men and the devil finds some other universe to fulfill its purpose, then it can be possible that man, without applying his prowess, can defend his rights, his honor, and his self. However, where there is evil along with piety and human nature is not completely cleansed of its satanic urging, which are always ready to lead man astray, piety cannot be left unguarded. Doing so and refraining from utilizing the God-given prowess is not only suicide, but is also amounts to directly aiding the evil. For surely it is not piety to provide opportunity for the cruel to commit his cruelty and for those who spread strife, to do their job. We can call such inaction cowardice and lack of determination. It cannot be likened to peacefulness, piety, and forgiveness. Piety in fact is another name for correction. It is the mixing of love with anger in moderation. If evil can be reformed with patience, tolerance, and kindness, these attributes should be utilized. However, in the event that these forces of love and kindness do not succeed, the forces of politics, penal law, redress, and revenge have to be utilized. One must not hesitate to do so, for correction and reform are the duties of man. He must utilize all beneficial and available means for achieving these ends. To unduly discriminate between the means and insist on a particular one, to the extent that it itself becomes a cause of strife, is neither very intelligent nor any great piety. The Christian perspective, that the main purpose of life is love and apart from this, all other emotions and ethics of man are untrue, and subduing them alone can help achieve deviousness, has its basis on a faulty thought process. The authors of this philosophy failed to comprehend that nothing in the world has been created without a purpose. They reached the conclusion that man's emotions of anger, desire, ego satisfaction, etc. are purposeless and that there is no place for bravery, courage, fearlessness, firmness, politics, law, justice, and so forth. This is untrue, all prowess of qualities, strengths, abilities, and emotions, that man has been gifted with are for a purpose. Like every part of man's body, even his hair have a function, none of man's physical and mental facilities, his apparent and hidden qualities and no emotion is purposeless. 
The wrong use of these qualities and prowess in no way indicates that they are evil in themselves but that man has not understood their purpose and that his intellect and understanding have not reached the stage where he can guide them for a useful purpose. For example, his desire is such an emotion, under the influence of which, man has committed more sins than on the prompting of any other emotion. However, on that basis it cannot be decided that the emotion be subdued or eliminated, for on its basis the well-being of humanity is dependent. Although, craving can make a man slave to his wants and propel him towards the worst of his sins, its total elimination cannot be decided because this emotion can be the reason for actions. Fury or anger has been the cause for numerous fights and cruelty, but from that, we cannot draw the conclusion that it is completely evil, that there is no use of it and that it is the main enemy of peace in the world, for in itself, it also is the main cause of peace being maintained in the world. Similar to the basic ones examined above is the case of the finer and nobler emotions. While they possess many virtues, their straying out of their bounds can take them to the limits of foolishness and overindulgence. Caution, for example, can acquire the shape of cowardice and unmanliness. If mercy is not kept within bounds, it becomes a cause for crime and lawlessness. If generosity crosses its limits, it leads to thriftless behavior and waste. If thrift on the other hand is beyond its bounds, it is miserliness. If love is not subject to moderation, it causes man to become blind to all else. If consideration and tolerance are not within bounds, mischief will be on the rise. If softness and tenderness is out of place, it gives rise to arrogance. If humility is misplaced, the ego and self-esteem are its victims. All emotions of man have the potential for vice or virtue. On the basis of just one of its aspects, their rightfulness or otherwise cannot be decided. It cannot be said that hands, feet, heart and mind are the only requirements of the body and we do not really need our lungs, kidneys, and so forth. It cannot be said of our senses, that the senses of hearing and sight are enough and we do not really need the sense of touch and taste. It cannot be said that only awareness and understanding produce feelings and that, for the purpose, memory and discrimination are not really required. Similarly, we cannot say that love, kindness, forgiveness and humility are the only required emotions and that we can do without hatred, anger, courage, daring self-esteem etc. just as the functions of the kidneys cannot be fulfilled by the liver and the heart cannot perform the functions of the mind, the functions of the emotions of anger and vengeance cannot be fulfilled by love and kindness and the place of law and politics cannot be taken by forgiveness. Like the good health of the body is dependent on its parts being moderately functional and intelligence is dependent on the functionality of our five senses, Ethical excellence can also be established in the event of moderation of desires and emotions, bringing into play all the forces of the ego at the right time and place and utilizing all natural prowess within bounds. Any religion that is not unnatural, guides man towards this very same moderation and bounds, not combating immoderation with another immoderation and one extravagance with another. Christianity has failed to understand this fact of nature. For that reason, it prescribes the relinquishment of the world for man and advises inaction as the way of life. However, this neither is a step towards the achievement of ethical excellence nor is it any service to humanity. Rather, it is a major disservice towards it. Those who choose to follow its prescribed way of life, on one hand deprive themselves of the pleasures of life that God created for them, while on the other hand, make themselves useless, depriving humanity of their services. Christianity has separated the kingdom of heaven from the kingdom of the earth. It orders the true follower to give up his wealth and, having forsaken the kingdom of the earth, fully commit himself to the kingdom of heaven. The natural conclusion from this is that all pious, brave, decent, tender-hearted, honest, and truthful people should give up the world and leave the business of running it to the lowest category of beings in the society, who are deprived of the virtues of kindness and honesty. Then the honest people would have to bear half the guilt for having failed to recognize their responsibility and having vacated the field of activities in favor of the crooked elements. The truth about the invitation to Christianity from the above discussion, it becomes obvious that the absence of war in Christianity is not an evidence of supremacy, 
rather of a weakness in the system. Christianity as we know it today has so many contradictions and weaknesses, that it is impossible for any nation to follow its prescribed path. A little more detailed study reveals another fact. We find that in its teachings, there is nothing more than a statement of some basic beliefs and principles of ethics. It neither contains detailed instructions for the conduct of religious affairs nor is it a viable code of ethics and there is no mention of rights and duties. All this, to the extent, that there exist no instructions even for the conduct of prayers. Obviously, such a system cannot be termed as viable. After knowing some basic principles of belief and ethics the followers still require guidance to deal with problems of the various spheres of life. The religion that is incapable of providing such guidance does not possess the potential of becoming a complete, distinct, and absolute religious system. The logical question that arises after this is, whether ISA is intended to pass on such an incomplete system of beliefs and religion as a permanent and viable one for his followers. Was he not aware that such a religion could not provide the required guidance to be followed by the whole human race or even by a nation? When we study the history of Christianity, the conditions it was born in and the reasons for its being, we have to find answers to the questions in the foregoing discussion. The fact is that Christianity was never intended to be a separate and viable religion. It was in fact the culmination of the Mosaic religion and a completion of instructions to the Israelites. When the Mosaic religion was revealed, it was the period of Israelite's intellectual infancy. At the time, they were quite incapable of accepting any complicated ethical instructions. Therefore, Musa as gave them a simple set of beliefs and teachings of some basic principles of ethics. Obviously, these were not complete in regards to the finer points, ethical dealings, spiritual cleansing, and religious spirit. For some centuries, the Israelites continued to follow the system of beliefs, but when they were accosted with more and more complicated affairs, the shortcomings of the system started showing their effects. 38. Gradually, the ethical conditions of the Israelites started deteriorating, until the condition reached the lowest point. Firstly, the communal system started to break down, and then conflicts between the various sections arose, which finally ended in their enslavement. This brought them to a very base level. After that, they remained in the slavery of the Babylonians. Again in 573 BC, the Iranians came and extended their mastery sabras. After that, Alexander the Great gained mastery over them. Their condition remained so between 334 BC and 323 BC after the death of Alexander, the Ptolemies of Egypt gained control over them. Again, a Greek family Slaustia was their masters in 198 BC and forced them into idol worshipping. Around the middle of the 2nd century, the Jews had the urge for freedom. They revolted and in 141 BC managed to establish their own government and state. This state existed for 80 years, due to their ethical conditions, they were not able to continue for very long in that condition. Internal conflicts arose and finally they themselves invited the Romans to their land. Sixty years before Jesus Isa as, Romans attacked Palestine and by the time Isa as was born, the entire nation was under Roman domination. In this way for seven to eight centuries, the Jews had to undergo the oppression of slavery of the Assyrian Ashur and Babylonian star worshippers, the Iranian fire worshippers and the Greek and Roman idol worshippers. The natural consequence of this long slavery and subservience was that the Jews became devoid of all ethics, decency, religiousness, and humanity. In the Bible itself, we can find much evidence of this degenerated condition of the Jews. In 7 BC, the evil ways that were being patronized and encouraged by Manasseh, the kings of Jerusalem, exemplify the degeneration that had set in among the Jews. He rebuilt the high places his father Hikikiah had destroyed, he also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab, king of Israel had done. He bowed down to the entire starry host and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. In both courts of the temple of the Lord built altars to the entire starry host. 
he sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced sorcery and divination, consulted mediums and spirits. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger. He took the carved Asherah pole he had made and put it in the temple, of which the Lord had said to David and to his son Solomon, This temple, and Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, I will put my name forever Kings, 2.21. In the Bible, Hosea, the prophet 284-147 BC, states of the ethical condition of the Jews of the era hear the word of the Lord, you Israelites, because the Lord had a charge to bring against you who live in the land there is no faithfulness, no love, on acknowledgement of God in the land. There is only cursing, lying, and murder, stealing and adultery, they break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed Hosea, 4.13. The prophet Isaiah 7401 BC, describing the conditions of the Jews states why should you be beaten any more? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of you, foot to the top of your head there is no soundness only wounds and welts and open sores, neither cleansed or bandaged nor soothed with oil. Isaiah, 157 Your country is desolate, your cities burned with fire, your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers Isaiah, 170. See how the faithful city has become a harlot. She once was full of justice, righteousness used to dwell in her but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your choice wine is diluted with water Isaiah, 12122 They have harps and lyres at their banquets, tambourines, and flutes and wine, but they have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hand. Therefore, my people will go into exile for lack of understanding, their men of rank will die of hunger and their masses will be parched with thirst. Therefore the grave enlarges its appetite and opens its mouth without limit, into it will descend the nobles and masses with all their brawlers and their revelers Isaiah, 5 12 14. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice to the innocent. Therefore, as tongues of fire lick up straw and as dry grass sinks down in the plains, so their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust, for they have rejected the law of the Lord Almighty and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel Isaiah, 5:22-24. Another prophet Micah states you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel, should you not know justice, you who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh, strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pen, like flesh for the pot. Micah, 323 You, who despise justice and distort all that, is right, who builds Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Her leaders, judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they lean upon the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No disaster will come upon us, Micah, 3 9 11 It becomes apparent from the sayings of the prophets of the Israelites that in that era the religious system of the Jews had become devoid of the real spirit. The strengths of belief, truth, honesty, law, justice, and ethical purity were missing. Making wealth impiously and illegally, greed, immodesty and cruelty and ribaldry had engulfed the nation. Their rulers were brutal and the citizenry generally undependable. Their chiefs had become untrustworthy and their followers extremely materialistic. They had started believing religion was restricted to ceremonies, poetry and the wordings of the scriptures were the real religion and they had started ignoring its real spirit, which actually is the very reason for religion. Seeing the rampant degeneration, the prophets of the Israelites, long before Christ, had been attempting some kind of reform in their society. With their sermons and advice, they had been attempting to remind them of the long-forgotten truth, that ceremonial sacrifice and prayers alone are not enough to satisfy God and that he is truly happy with uprightness and the fair conduct of affairs. To gain his favor, forgiveness, love, and sacrifice are the requirements. Advice in this context are aplenty in the Bible The multitude of your sacrifices what are they to me says the Lord, 
I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened animals, I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New homes, Sabbaths, and convocations I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me, I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood, wash and make yourselves clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong, learn to do right. Seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land, but if you resist and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. Isaiah 1 11 20 At another place prophet Isaiah, preaching of the truthfulness of prayers and actions and the piety of high ethical values, says your fasting ends in quarreling and strife, and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen to loosen the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked, to clothe him, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear, then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard Isaiah, 58 4, 8. At another place, Micah gives the same message, saying with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Micah, 668 These teachings fell on deaf ears and for seven centuries, the deteriorating conditions did not show any improvement. The ethical bankruptcy that had set in among the Israelites needed stronger medicine. Isa as appeared as a light from the heavens in the situation. He chose to further the teachings of Isaiah and Micah, with a new fervor and spirit. Like the teachings of the prophets of the past, his teachings were also based on the Mosaic religion. Its purpose was not to supersede Judaism and introduce a new religion. Rather, its sole purpose was to fill in the gaps left in the teachings of Musa as and to instill among the Jews, an ethical spirit, the lack of which they showed. At this time, the ethics of the Jews were seriously short of sincerity, tenderness, forgiveness, piety and satisfaction with their lot, pity, kindness and the sense of sacrifice. Their exhibitionism, love of the world, greed and selfishness knew no bounds. The spirit of religiousness, which is a necessity for humanity, was totally missing from their society. Their foe Isa is mainly concentrated on correcting these faults. He maintained the Mosaic religion and only made those additions that were the requirements of the time 39. In fact, the religion of Christ Isa as was not a new one, but a continuation of the religion of Musa as. The same is stated in the Bible, in the words of Isa as do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, the least stroke of the pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven Luke. 16:17 The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. 
so you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Matthew 23:14. The Bible of John explains further, the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus. John 1:17. From the quotations, it is obvious that all the teachings of Musa as form a part of Christianity. Only their truth and sanctity have been further established. The reasons of absence of war from the teachings of Christianity after the foregoing discussion, it is not necessary that in Christianity all instructions regarding war, treaties, conflicts, government, politics, and so forth, given in the Torah have been kept intact, without a word being changed. This was so because at the time of the birth of the religion, there was no occasion for referring to them or for implementing them. It has been stated earlier, that by the time of Christianity, the Jews had suffered slavery for some seven to eight hundred years. Twenty years before the birth of Isa as, Rome had attacked Palestine and Roman troops had conquered all its territories. When Isa as was born, the entire nation of Jews was under the yoke of Roman slavery. Their particular homeland, Yahudia, came under Roman control in 2 AD and was administered by a Roman administrator, whom they called a procurator. At the advent of the prophethood of Isa as, Jerusalem was under a very unjust and unconscionable procurator named Pontius Pilate. The slavery of these sacrilegious and unconscionable rulers had brought the moral and ethical conditions of the Jews to a very low ebb. In the very sight of Isa as, a noble of Galilee, heroes, had, just to please a dancing girl, put Yahya as John the Baptist to death. The esteem they attached even to Isis as life is apparent from the fact that they had considered of more value the life of a robber, Barnabas, to his. Under the circumstances, it was not possible for Isis to rise with the flag of war and establish an independent Christian state. He had seen that the spirit had left the Jewish nation, they had no strength of character left, and neither was there any strength left in their nationalism. The first and foremost task for him was to extract his race from the pit of ethical depravity it had fallen into and imbue it with the spirit of ethical uprightness, without which, no nation can be capable of casting off the chains of slavery and to maintain its independence. He therefore, in the beginning, concentrated on the character building of the Jews. However, in his continual efforts in this direction, he also had to ensure that he did not enter into conflict with the Romans. For if there had been a conflict, there were chances that he would neither have succeeded in the contest nor he would have been able to accomplish his mission. He therefore made all efforts to avoid conflict. When the Jewish scholars, attempting to have him involved, pleadingly asked his advice, on whether they should pay taxes to the Caesar of Rome, he replied with a reply that can be interpreted in two ways, that they should pay Caesar his due and God his. Luke 2022 He advised his followers not to rise against mischief makers and pray for the well-being of those who treated them cruel, if someone caught them for forced labor, that they should go the extra mile with them, if someone snatched their tunic, they should give him their tunic as too, if someone struck them on one cheek, they should offer him the other cheek as well. Initially, the objective of these instructions was that there should be no conflict with the emperors and that the Jewish people would get used to tolerating hardships. Later, he gradually started instilling in his nation steadfastness, tolerance, composure, and courage. In order to make them fit to face hardships, he tried to remove from their psyches the fear of death and of the ruler's cruelty and power. He stated, when you are brought before governors and kings, and made to suffer torture, remain steadfast Mark, 13 in order to remove from their hearts the love for life and instead, to imbue them with the readiness to die, he stated, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it Luke, 9:24. he taught them not to depend on the favors of the rulers but be satisfied with the gifts of God, since such favors are the very factor by virtue of which the rulers enchant slave nations. He stated if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him Luke, 
11.13 I tell you my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear, fear him who, after the killing of the body, has power to throw you in hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him Luke, 12.45 All that he preached was necessary so that the nation, which had suffered centuries of slavery, gradually be prepared to fight for its freedom. Initially his teachings were limited to this aspect only. Later he was proceeding towards the aspect of war and at times expressed his preference for killing the enemy. He stated on one occasion that he desired that he Isa as should be their king, he wanted them to be brought before him and killed. He even instructed his followers to carry swords. Luke states, he said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag, and if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That is enough, he replied Luke, 22 3638 However, after this progress in attitude, the two to three years he lived was insufficient time for him to prepare a nation for war in the cause of God. In that period, Neither the number of his followers was sufficient to take on the might of the Roman Empire nor was the ethical teaching so complete that, like the companions of Prophet Muhammad saw, they may be ready to face bravely all the hardships and dangers of leaving their sanctuary and facing the strongest in battle. Their beliefs by the time were not so firm that they would openly declare themselves for the righteous cause. Even the well-beloved of the followers of Christ, Peter, was in the condition that when he was arrested and questioned, whether he was the follower of Isa as before the rooster could crow twice, he disowned Christ, three times Mark, 1431 other of his followers, Judas Iscariot, had him captured, only for thirty pieces of silver Matthew, 2614 when Jesus was captured, all his disciples deserted him Matthew, 2656 obviously, when this was the condition of his specially favored followers and trusted disciples, he could not have gone to war with a force of more of such undependable followers. If however, like the prophet of Arabia, Isa has had sufficient time, he could possibly also have been able to instill in his followers the spirit of fighting and the willingness to give their lives for a just cause. However, the nation of Isa as did not give him even three full years to complete his mission, depriving him of the opportunity to do something big for the well-being and glory of the Jews. In that short period of time, only that could be achieved which was actually achieved by Isa as. If we go through the life of Prophet Muhammad saw, we will not find in the initial three years of his life in Mecca, any trace of war or battle. In that period, we will detect even there, the teachings of steadfastness, strength of belief and conviction, contentment with one s lot, self-control, and ethical improvement, as we see in the short period of the prophethood of Isa as dot the relation between Judaism and Christianity if the teachings of Isa as are considered in the light of the foregoing and of understanding, we find them having two aspects. One is that in which Isa as has attempted to bring to a conclusion the teachings of Musa as and where necessary has made required additions. In the Mosaic, religion there was a lack of graciousness, beneficence, selflessness, and love. Isa has made an addition of these to it. Where the teachings of Musa as were unbending and the concept of humanity was very hazy, Isa has made the necessary improvements. He instructed the Israelites on love of humanity, as a whole. Whereas Judaism stressed mainly on the duties of man and subjects, love, kindness, and ethical supremacy were not discussed much, that Isa has stressed mainly on these aspects, with special reference to alms, open-heartedness, kindness, sacrifice, graciousness and so forth. This part of the teachings of Isa as was not by itself a separate and viable religion. It was in fact a continuation and a necessary addition of the Mosaic religion. The second aspect of the teachings of Isa as is that in which Isa as, keeping in view the particular condition of ethics, politics, and collective living of the Israelites, had attempted their reform. For example, among the Jews, the greed for wealth and love of life had gained extraordinary significance, Isa has tried to overcome these by his teachings of satisfaction with one s lot and preaching that there were other things more important than just existence in the world. 
Among the Jews, hard-heartedness, cruelty, and unkindness were high, Isaias tried to combat these with his teachings of the excellence of forgiveness, kindness, and so forth. Among the Jews, miserliness had peaked, Isaias in reply preached graciousness and beneficence. The Jewish chiefs and scholars were serious victims of egocentricity, self-love, pride, and arrogance, in order to bring them into moderation Isaias, instructed them in humility, piety, and religiousness. The Jews within the Roman Empire were slaves, weak and unable to help themselves, Isa as stressed on tolerance of cruelty and stopped them from fighting for their rights. He taught them, that the real strength was in tolerance, steadfastness, patience, and courage. This second aspect of the teachings of Isa as was specially addressed to the situation the Israelites were in at that time. It was not his intention to make it a permanent universal code. Specially, the teachings of tolerant inaction, offering the other cheek, going the extra mile, or offering the cloak to the one who snatched one's tunic, were applicable to a particularly slavish mentality that had developed as a result of ages of slavery. Prescribing it as a policy for the politics of an independent nation was neither intended nor was correct. The separation of Christian dogma and denomination only a few years after the crucifixion, according to the Christian belief of Isa, as all the principles and rules on which he had laid the foundation of his reforms were broken. His teachings were changed to the extent that the true and the actual ones vanished from the earth. The person responsible for these drastic changes was St. Paul. Nothing can be said of his motives for his actions. It is possible that after remaining strictly opposed to the message of Isa as throughout the latter's life until two years after it, he actually sincerely converted to Christianity. It is, however, also a fact that he did not have the benefit of the company of Isa as, thus did not have an opportunity to understand fully the true spirit of the religion. As compared to those followers of Isa as, who had the advantage of the constant companionship of the prophet Isa as, he could not have the true and in-depth perception of Christianity. It can be said therefore, that when he refounded the religion anew, against the advice of such of the companions of Isa as as St. Peter, his actions, though they may not have been based on unholy intentions, they definitely had their basis on lack of knowledge 40. The first such alteration was that St. Paul declared that the message of Isa as addressed the entire humanity, although in fact the real addressees of the message were the Israelites only. When Isa as sent his disciples to invite people to his religion, he specifically instructed them, saying these twelve, Jesus sent out with the following instructions, do not go among the Gentile, or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel Matthew, I-056 Isa as himself in his entire life did not invite any non-Israelite nation to Christianity, nor did he accept any such person into the religion. Before the rise of St. Paul, the disciples of Jesus too invited only the Israelites. Until that time, the message of Isa as was an instruction of reforms for the Jews only milkman, History of Christianity, Volume 1, page 337. In the year 49 AD, in the Conference of Christian Followers, a large group was still in favor of the contention that the teachings of Isa as were meant for the followers of the Mosaic religion. Milman, History of the Christianity, Volume 1, page 393, and Du Mello, Commentary on the Holy Bible, page LXXX1X. However, St. Paul, ignoring the truth of the preaching of Isa as, his explanations and the knowledge and belief of the disciples, declared that the teachings were of universal applicability. To uphold his contention St. Paul declared that at his crucifixion and after he had passed away, Isa as had come to his disciples and told them to spread the word to the whole world Matthews, 2819. It was difficult however, to make the non-Israelite nations subservient to the Mosaic rules, since its many ceremonies and ways were disliked by them. Therefore, the question arose, whether on inviting other nations to Christianity, following the Mosaic system could be made obligatory? In this connection, Isa as had been specific that the earth and sky can change, but not a word of the Torah, that he had come not to cancel the teachings of Torah but to complete them and that only he could enter the kingdom of heaven, 
who followed the instructions of Torah. Milman, History of Christianity, page 392. After these explanations, it was not possible for any true Christian to divorce the Mosaic religion from Christianity. The non-Israelite, non-believers, who partially or wholly denied the Mosaic teachings, could not have entered the folds of Christianity. St. Paul, however, unilaterally declared that any non-Israelite, whether or not he followed the percepts of Judaism could enter Christianity. These changes and alterations, angered the Christians in general acts, chapter 21 and the influential of Christianity protested against it. But St. Paul declared such respected disciples as St. Peter and Barnabas being misled or telling the untruth, started preaching against the teachings of Moses Galatians, 2.13. He writes in a letter addressed to the Galatians know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. If righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. 2.1621 All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one is justified before God by the law, because, the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law 3.10.13 So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law 3.24.25 It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery of the law you who are trying to be justified by law, have been alienated from Christ, you have fallen away from grace. But by faith we eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope 515, in this way Christianity separated from the Mosaic dogma. Therefore, the religious teachings that were really a part of and an addition of the religion of Musa as were made a permanent and independent universal religion. The effects of the separation on the character of Christianity St. Paul's followers took over the task of spreading this incomplete religion, which was not in fact the original Christianity, but which may be termed as Pauline in reference to St. Paul, leaving out the Israelites. They chose for their preaching, the independent nations of Greece and Rome. However, without an elaborate system and without a system of law, a set of exclusively ethical instructions, which were in fact intended for a nation long enslaved and oppressed, was quite meaningless for free and politically independent nations. This version of Christianity if we like to call it, that contained no complete canonical instructions which would prove beneficial in the varying situations that an ordinary congregation of humans faces in its life. It was just a collection of some pieces of ethical advice, which tended towards extremism. Obviously being dedicated to these instructions, only in the absence of an elaborate superstructure of beliefs and laws, would have spelt the death of a nation. Resultant to following this creed, the Christians had to suffer subjection to all kinds of hardships and cruelty. However, they suffered, almost readily, for tolerance was the objective of the teachings given to them and post that no path was outlined for them to follow. Later, not owing to any planning or effort on their part, but by chance when they gained power and independence, they found it impossible to lead the lives of constraint, prescribed by Paulistic Christianity. They broke all bounds and were close to the limits of cruelty, murder, and destruction. The effects of the initial teachings of Christianity of offering the other cheek and not fighting mischief, as so strong that even when their numbers grew and their sphere of influence considerably increased, the spirit for fighting for their rights remained absent from their psyches. In 64 AD when the numbers of Christians in Rome, Greece, Syria, and Palestine, were in thousands, Nero had them falsely accused of enmity of Rome. By his orders, anyone who proclaimed being a Christian was arrested. Some were crucified, some burnt alive, and some were put before dogs, to be torn up. Hundreds of Christian women became the targets of wild animals or of gladiators in the Roman arenas. In 70 AD, when Titus attacked Jerusalem, 97,000 men and women were enslaved, 11,000 of these died of hunger and thousands were sent to the Roman amphitheaters, to provide their much-relished, cruel spectator sport. 
Gibbon, Volume 2, Chapter 16, Early Days of Christianity, page 488-489. After Nero, Marcus Aurelius, Septimus, Decius, and Valerian, tried their hands at eliminating Christianity and Christians, but later, Diocletian surpassed them all in cruelty. He passed an order that all churches and monasteries be raised, all the Bibles that they could lay their hands on be burnt, and everything of value in the churches be confiscated. In 303 AD the emperor, himself burned down the central monastery of Nicomedia and threw the holy books into the fire. In 304 AD, he passed the general order that any who insisted on Christianity be put to death. Later the persecution reached the extent that anyone who did not agree to change his religion, his body was slashed and vinegar and salt poured on his wounds. Then, piece by piece their flesh was torn off their bodies. Sometimes they were locked up in monasteries and then the monasteries were put on fire. For more pleasure, the Christians were caught and laid on burning coals or their bodies pierced by metallic spikes. This was the time when the Christians occupied the empire offices in large numbers, holding both high and low appointments. In the Emperor's palace, itself a large number of Christians were in employment. Rev. Cuts, Constantine the Great, page 5560. However, the Christians had been convinced, however great their numbers may be, however powerful they might become, the instructions regarding tolerance and offering the other cheek and not rising up against oppression, held their validity. For this reason, nowhere in the world, whether it be Rome, Italy, Sicily, Spain, Gaul, Illyria, or Asia Minor, any resistance was put up against the oppressors and the entire nation underwent the cruelty with suicidal inaction. In contrast, if we look at the Islamic history, the followers of Muhammad saw, who had been instructed on the sanctity of fighting for a rightful cause, even when their numbers were as little 300, were ready to take on all of Arabia. They proved to the world that a nation imbued with the spirit of fighting for the right cause, despite the shortage of fighting forces and despite being most poorly equipped, cannot remain subservient to any power. These were the times of weakness and oppression for Christianity. Later, when the Emperor Constantine the Great accepted the Christian faith and it became the de facto state religion, this weakness of tolerance, reached in one leap the very limits of excessive behavior. The reason for the earlier weakness was that Christianity kept itself divorced from politics and the business of civilization and its followers had accepted following the dictates of their religion, that is, they accepted following a life of tolerance. Now when by chance, the responsibilities of governance were thrust on them, another graver weakness took root. Since their religion had not provided them the guidelines for rulership, they, in the absence of dictates of God on the subject, began to rely on the dictates of the ego. Governance includes politics as well as penalties, war as well as peace, and vengeance as well as tolerance and forgiveness. However, the separation from the Mosaic religion, denied it any rules and guidance in respect of state functions. Except for instructing its followers that they should not oppose the oppressor, that they should offer their cloaks to the one who snatched their tunics, had not provided them any guidance that would help them run the affairs of the state. However, remaining within the bounds of these instructions, it was not possible for them to run the state. Therefore, they were forced to break free of the bounds and found themselves free to follow the dictates of their ego. As a result, the strife, turmoil, arrogance, and turbulence unleashed by the Christians were such that the effects can be felt until today. During the time of Constantine, more than half the population of the kingdom were idol worshippers, therefore he could not dare to treat them cruelly. He had to satisfy himself with destroying the gates and roofs of their places of worship, confiscating the valuables, clothes, and jewelry that adorned the idols, and removing the idols themselves from the buildings they were housed in. Rev. Cuts, Constantine the Great, page 278 Some years later, when the church gained supremacy in the state affairs, the ardent followers of Christianity, dedicated themselves to crushing the other non-Christian religions and adopted the following principles, which encompassed many others 1. 
the sins that the magistrate did not forbid or did not punish those indulging in it would be considered to some extent a participant in them. To the worship of false gods and idols is in fact showing disrespect of the God Almighty and is a detestable crime. In order to put these principles into force, the Roman Senate enacted the law that the religion of Rome was not the worship of Jupiter but the worship of Jesus after this idol worship, religious offerings to the idols and religious sacrifices were all forbidden by law. Severe punishment was prescribed for any found indulging in these crimes. Emperor Theodosius ruled all unchristian worship, whether open or in private, an offense punishable by death. Along with this, he passed general orders for destroying all temples, confiscating their lands, and destroying generally, all materials of idol worship. Initially, the center was cleared of such worship and then it was the turn of the provinces. In Gaul, the bishop took an army of padres and had all temples, other places of worship, idols, and even the trees held sacred, destroyed. In Syria, the religious head, Marcellus, who was the diocese of Apamea, had the magnificent temple of Jupiter raised. He gathered a strong force with the help of which he undertook the destruction of all temples he came across or heard of in his area of influence. In Alexandria, the Archbishop of Egypt, Theophilus, had the Temple of Serpias, an extraordinary example of Greek architecture, destroyed and had its library, an extraordinary collection of knowledge, burnt down 41. The statue of Serpius was broken into many pieces and its arms dragged through the streets of Alexandria as an insult to those who worshipped Serpius. Later in the view of thousands, its pieces were burned. Thus without formal sanction in other provinces too, an army of zealots went about wantonly attacking peaceful citizens and destroying historical, architecturally superb constructions, in their religious fervor 42. The result of this cruelty was that the idolatrous citizenry adopted the religion, in fear of the sword that they really did not accept from their hearts. The Christian monasteries were thus filled with disheartened and unbelieving followers. Just 38 years later, the magnificent Roman Empire was lost without a sign of it left. Europe, Africa, and Asia Minor were converted to Christianity, by the dint of the sword. After this, the conflicts between the Christians and others, and even among Christians themselves, were totally devoid of humanity and principles, in which cruelty was at its peak. Many pages of history remained blackened by the horrifying description of events in these conflicts. Of the ways and means adopted to rid their lands of all non-Christian beliefs, one was in the form of religious courts inquisitions. These inquisitions came into being on the express orders of the Pope of Rome. In these, the crimes that people were tried for included heresy, blasphemy, Judaism, Islam, and mistreatment of the spouse. According to the law in force, the punishments for such crimes included, but were not limited to, burning people alive, cutting off the tongues, digging out the dead and buried, and casting their bones outside. On account of these inquisitions, in Spain alone, 340,000 people were put to death in various ways. Out of these, 32,000 were burnt alive. Apart from Spain, those who similarly lost their lives in Carthage, Sicily, Sardinia, Malta, Naples, Milan, Flanders etc., numbered no lesser than 150,000. Encyclopedia Britannica, Arts, Inquisition This policy was the other result of the defective teachings of Christianity. The first result being that when the Christians initially started following the religion, they became too soft and tender-hearted. Even when they had the ability to defend themselves, they tolerated cruelty and oppression. Thus, they continued tolerating the process of their extermination for about 300 years. Subsequently, when times favored them, they gained power as a result of statehood being bestowed on them, they had to climb out of the narrow restrictions their religion imposed on them. Not finding the needed divine guidance and direction, they started following the dictates of their ego and subjecting humanity to all kinds of cruelty and oppression. Occasionally, savagery did play its role in some of the Muslim wars. Muslims too can be accused of waging wars for territory etc., claiming these to be wars in the name of Islam. However, 
the basic difference is that for the excesses of the Muslims, Islam cannot be held blameworthy. The injunctions of Islam are in consonance with the need of the times and human nature. They are not unnatural that following them or remaining within their bounds would be quite impossible. Nor are they so permissive that they allow the human being to do what he likes, unquestioned. For this reason, all excessive behavior can be termed as unlawful. The law or rules of Islam cannot take the blame for such actions. As opposed to Islam, Christianity has not provided its followers any set of rules as guidance for the actions and interactions of routine life. It has not guided them as to the means and ways they should adopt to gain strength and if they are in a position of strength, how their strength is to be used, on what basis and principles, treaties can be entered into with other nations, the permissible causes of wars, the code of conduct in battlefields, the treatment to be meted out to the fallen enemy, the concessions to be granted to people of other religions and if they are to be disciplined, the causes for which they can be taken to task. Christianity, therefore, has to take part of the blame for excesses committed by its followers, both when they kept strictly within its bounds and while they were outside of them. It cannot stand blameless, saying that its followers deviated from the correct path they were instructed to follow, since there was no such path shown to them at all. Christianity would have to adopt one of the standpoints. It would have to either declare all those Christians as sinners who accepted the office of running a state and its politics, even if the execution was fair and true or else declare all such rulers blameless, even if their conduct in that position was vicious and unrighteous. There is no third option for Christianity. Not having been instructed on the code of conduct, those involved were forced to do what appeared best to their own limited sense of discrimination between righteous and unrighteous behavior. An overview of the teachings of the four major religions of the world We have discussed the aspect of war in the four major religions of the world. This presents to us two varied schools of thought. Two of these major religions consider war permissible. However, the extent of their permissibility permits them to wage wars in any cause their ego finds justifiable. Their causes have no bearing on righteousness or unrighteousness. Neither an elevated aim is presented to man in their teachings nor is guidance provided towards the achievement of any ethical excellence. Rather, these religions permit their followers the freedom of indulgence in the natural desire to arrogate the rights of any and to usurp whatever they desire. Whatever progress these nations have made in the ethical sense is that they have laid down some rules for such adventures. They insist on their adherence that whenever they wish to go on a manhunt war they have to adopt certain methods and avoid certain others. Along with this, they have divided the earth into boundaries on geographical, racial, and linguistic basis. Some races have been granted certain privileges, of which, the rest of humanity have been deprived. The other two religions do not consider the permissibility of human beings to arrogate the rights of others, while correct. This consideration takes them to the other extreme. They have progressed from fighting against conflict to fighting against human nature itself. They wish to totally destroy some of the capabilities and strengths God has granted man for the establishment of moderation in the world. On the other hand, they wish to impose certain other restrictions on human nature. The result is that those who follow their dictates find themselves in the pit of humility, humiliation, and disgrace. Those who are unable to follow their dictates and are obliged to undertake the duties of normal civic lives, do not find the light of guidance in any sphere of activity, with the result that these poor creatures have placed their full dependence on their own faulty intellect and desires. They have to wander rudderless through the sea of life. Between the two extremes of excessiveness and scant, Islam has shown a way of moderation. It puts forward a system that seeks satisfaction of human nature, desires, and wants. At the same time, it seeks the reforms of humanity. With the purpose of these reforms, it divides wars into two categories. One is fought for land, wealth, supremacy, and subservience of the enemy or for the satisfaction of the ego. The other category is of those wars that are fought in the affirmation of righteousness and for the eradication of strife and cruelty. In the first of the two categories, Islam terms turmoil and tumult as strife. It declares such wars the worst of sins and is strictly against it. Conversely, 
if wars are fought only in the interest of righteousness and do not involve the ego, Islam declares these a supreme worship, a very sacred obligation and declares that there is no better service to humanity than participating in such wars. It lays down the bounds of even such righteous wars and the occasions under which they may be undertaken. It outlines the causes and purposes for which such wars become necessary and the ways and means to be employed in their pursuance have been outlined with clarity, so that this august institution is not exploited for satanic purposes and prevent egoistic desires from entering into the consideration. The institution of war in Islam is governed by an elaborate and complete system and law, the like of which is not seen in any other religion. It is an undeniable fact that except Islam, no other religion has been able to keep war within its natural bounds and to raise it from the status of a savage conflict to that of respectable combat, from cruelty to the status of justice and from mischief to piety. By adopting its laws of warfare, the world can save itself from the curse of cruelty and oppression, as well as from the curse of being cruelly treated.